In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, all those in the audience and them listening at home. Okay. We're going to start off uh, public comment. Anyone here for public comment? Nope. Okay. You gotta raise your hand if you want. Oh, right to, just come right up to the podium and just state your name, please. Good evening. My name is Good. David O'Neill. Nine Heritage Way, North Reading. I just wanted to address the ongoing situation with the snow plowing and the snow shoveling on the sidewalks. I think that, first of all, let me make it clear, I do believe they should be taken care of. They should be cleared. However, I think that by putting the onus on the business owners, I think you're losing sight of who makes up Main Street. We don't have big corporations with facility departments that we can send a couple of guys out to take care of it. These are all small businesses. When you talk to the people up and down Main Street, they're very upset about it. I think you need to look at who you're affecting. You try to get someone to come in, unless they can plow and do the shoveling, they're not gonna do it. So somebody that takes care of it, plowing it themselves, has to now try to find somebody else to do the shoveling. And you can't physically, manually do it because the plows come right back and push more ice on it. So it means having people come back three, four, five times during the storm. Now the town has at least one bobcat that I see driving around. I know we have a very well-run public works department. I'm sure we can find one guy somewhere that can give an hour to go up and down Main Street and plow it. So that's all I need to say. I think that you're really losing sight. These are small business people. These are not big corporations with endless supplies of staff to do this. Thank you. I want to remind Mr. O'Neill that it's going to be on the agenda for about 7.30. So if you want to hang around and listen, David, it's going to come up again around 7.30. Any other comments? Please. Yeah, Jack Hasham, Hasham Realty, uh, 133 Main Street. In uh, one of the small businesses that uh, just spoke about, and we have a half a dozen properties or so up and down Maine, and many of them don't have sidewalks. And uh, it's very difficult to have, I mean, we have like about a 50 foot wide state highway that the plows take all the snow and ice and slush and put them on the sidewalk and then tell the private people to get rid of it. And it, it really adds a big burden to the snow plowing because we're dealing with the average local people with a pickup and a plow. We don't have track machines or sidewalk plows or snow blowers and all that different type of stuff. So, plus, and to be honest with you, in the winter time, it's really, I don't believe, a good idea to promote walking at Main Street with the uh, lack of many sidewalks in many of the properties. I know on our properties ourselves, some of them have a sidewalk like the Heritage Building. But then you go to the property next door, it doesn't. Further up at 203 Main Street, I have the North Reading Medical Building. The next, the next site has a couple hundred feet of black mulch and shrubs about this high. So you promote them to walk in front of mine if it's plowed, and all of a sudden you run into a snow bank, they, they gotta go out in the street and it, with snow banks and narrow roads and sleet and ice and so on. It's really not set up until the road is finished with proper sidewalks that can be plowed. And one person not just doing them piecemeal, everybody at a different schedule plowing from one person to another. And there's no way to put it. Many of the properties are only 10, 15,000 square foot lots. So you're in the situation where you may need loaders and other things that we don't typically plow with. So it puts a big burden on the business along Main Street. And a few of the areas that I've done well, like in front of Stop and Shop, it's great, but people usually don't just walk back and forth in front of Stop and Shop. They have to go from there to one of the other properties. And the other properties, a lot of them don't have sidewalks. All in front of like Bill Murphy's properties, just dirt, it's never plowed. The other sidewalks like we have further up are just small ones. The town put a small one in front of 203 Main. 
And like I said, the next one's Bach Motion Shrubs, so you can't walk it, you can't plow. So, and, and if you drive up and down Main Street, that's true to almost everywhere up in this, uh, the north side. So it puts a, you know, then our plow guys get aggravated, and it's a big safety hazard for them pulling in and out of the curb cut with traffic coming, usually poor visibility, sleet, snow, and ice and rain. And they're trying to back up and put in and out of curb cuts and pushing snow around. Then you get to the next property. You can't push it on their property because it's not yours. I just don't feel it's the responsibility of the property owners to have the flow of walking traffic up and down Main Street be their responsibility. Uh, the property doesn't even belong to us. So the bird you know, property owner with going out and plowing the properties and putting 55, you know, 50 feet wide of snow and slush and say, okay, you take care of it, do something with it. You know, I don't think it should be the responsibility, liabilities, and a lot of other things that go along with it. That's basically what I have to say. Anybody else open? Uh, for public comment, please, sir. Just state your name and address, please. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Matt Donnelly. I'm actually a resident of Reading. However, I'm a uh, business owner in North Reading, have been since 1995. Um, as a small business in 1995, we started out with a very, very small business. My business, Donnelly Service Group Inc. We're a taxpayer in North Reading. And uh, as our business grew over the years, we're, we're, we're not a property owner, but we've been a, a tenant on Main Street. Um, we pay property taxes. We pay excise taxes from what started as one car to a fleet of about 20 cars now. Over the years, and my, my children now go to Reading schools. Um, I do not have trash pickup in North Reading. I don't feel we put a lot of burden on North Reading while, while we pay in. Uh, I have concern about this issue, this issue because of the undue burden of the amount of snow coming off a four-lane highway onto sidewalks. We're not talking about shoveling six inches of snow. We're talking about a lot of slush, a lot of ice, this is a danger to a lot of business owners. Many of the business owners, some, some handicapped small business owners that may have one, two employees or property owners. Um, at the same time, it's a workers' comp risk. And I, I just can't understand why the town of North Reading would put business owners at that kind of risk on a state road when that kind of snow and danger is being put on these sidewalks. I just feel this is, this is just a, a, a workaround that's not fair to business owners. Furthermore, it feels like a, a adds bureaucracy to the system. To be putting these kind of, if assessment of what the right word is, on top of businesses, when you have different kinds of leases put in place, whether it be triple net or gross, you're gonna have residents and businesses within your town chasing each other, trying to figure out who this is on, who's bearing the burden of this. Somebody has to be out policing this. Wouldn't the simple choice be, okay, we have a policy, we're not gonna do sidewalks, so we're gonna do sidewalks, versus let's put the burden on and chase people down, chase them for money. It just, it just seems like a very unfriendly environment moving forward. So I just want to express my, express my views. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Public comment? Uh, Mr. Gilberto, I wanted to give you a moment before we go into the proclamation for the Veterans Day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to read from a statement. As the community knows, the October the 29th, 30th wind and rainstorm resulted in damage throughout North Reading and the region. One component of that damage was that United States flags placed at veteran grave markers at Riverside Cemetery and other cemeteries were scattered around the grounds of those cemeteries. In the case of Riverside Cemetery, Department of Public Works crews were required to work hastily to pick up the damaged or uprooted flags and storm debris so that the cemetery would be passable and presentable for two burials on the morning following the storm and additional burials late last week. The response resulted in the dedicated temporary storage containers for damaged or faded flags at the cemetery becoming filled over capacity, causing some flags to fall to the ground and onto nearby vegetation. While this incident was an unfortunate result of the quick response by our DPW crews early last Monday morning, it does not reflect the high regard and gratitude the town including our DPW crews, hold for its veterans. We apologize to our veterans, to the families of those buried at Riverside Cemetery, and to our residents. We do not take this incident lightly. We can and must do better.
Today, in consultation with the North Reading Veterans Services Director, the DPW Director has established a flag storage and disposal, or retirement, protocol for the over 500 flags that are placed on veterans' graves each Memorial Day and Veterans Day by our DPW crews. The Veterans Services Director, in consultation with the various veterans committees, will also be working to establish a community flag retirement ceremony for residents to properly dispose of household U.S. flags in the future. I wish to thank the residents who stepped forward to properly remove the flags from Riverside Cemetery over the weekend. Their demonstration of citizenship in action is greatly appreciated. Pre-retirement cemetery and other town facility flags are now stored in appropriate sheltered containers and DPW will be working with the fire department and veteran services director to properly retire cemetery and other town facility flags after Veterans Day ceremonies have concluded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Schultz, I'll take the, the proclamation for Veterans Day. Do you want me to read the proclamation of the record? Uh, Mr. Chair, whereas on this day we gather here to honor our men and women who have taken an oath to secure, defend, and maintain the very core principles which our nation was founded, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Since the birth of our nation, no single generation has been spared the responsibility of defending our aggressors domestically or abroad, and whereas on this day we honor our warriors for continuing to secure and safeguard our borders, emulating our forefathers by carrying on the values and traditions that were instilled through the generations. They continue to serve in harm's way with many serving several combat tours. Keep them in prayer and whereas on this day we give recognition and respect to our Blue Star families for the sacrifices they have made. Support is imperative to the continued success of the warrior's struggle to overcome the adversities of war men mentally and physically. War affects the family. Please remain vigil of your neighbors and children who may be enduring the effects of a loved one serving overseas as well as their return home. And whereas on this day we honor our Gold Star families who have sacrificed the ultimate, keep them in your prayers for their lives have changed forever. They carry the legacy of their loved one through their memories. For those who have loved ones missing in action or held captive, continue to pray for their return. And whereas on this day we renew our commitment to our children through guidance, in education, the importance of honor, respect, and appreciation for the valor and sacrifice our veterans and warriors have made. Continue to educate them on the history of this great nation. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of North Reading, do hereby proclaim that Veterans Day shall be celebrated on the 11th day of November 2017 in the town of North Reading. We encourage you to continue to display the American flag with pride on your homes, offices, and town buildings to recognize the valor and sacrifices of our veterans and warriors through ceremony and prayer. Mr. Chairman, I move to sign the Veterans Day Proclamation. Motion, do I have a second? Second. Mr. O'Leary, second. Any more, any discussion? Um, I'll just make sure that the ceremony is on the 11th. Is it gonna be outdoor or are we gonna be doing it indoors this year? <coughs> well, they forecasted, um, the pending forecast for Saturday has gone from 50 to 43 to now 37 degrees expecting winds of, of, of that nature. My concern is more of the elderly being out there. Um, I don't want to have to deter them from not being able to come to the ceremony, so I am have already contacted the bachelor's school to secure it for that day. Um, I know it's hard because I got I'm Militia who's here today. Um, it you know the volleying and that, but um, um, unfortunately, I, I, my feel is we need to do it in for We need to do it inside just for the safety and the health of the others that are coming. Okay. As soon as the uh, details are put out, we'll Saturday. Yeah. It, it, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, it will be up. On, I'll have uh, Chief Murphy put it up on his website as well. Um, it will go in the transcript, and I will get it sent out through my events listings as well as through the school to, uh, to let the uh, parents know. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Unanimous. Mr. Okay. Chairman. And the next uh, agenda item is to vote to rename the Veterans Affairs Committee. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to disband the Veterans Affairs Committee and establish a Veterans Events Committee with the following charge. The Veterans Event Committee will coordinate, establish, and execute events and activities for veterans, warriors, their families, and the community at large. The events and activities will also serve as venues to outreach to our local veterans and their families, providing them with information on local, state, and federal services available 
for those who have served and sacrificed protecting our borders. The committee shall consist of five voting members, one position for a one-year term, two positions for a two-year term, two positions with a three-year term, and up to five associate members with three-year terms. And further, non-residents with uh, demonstrated ties to North Reading will be permitted to join the committee. Second. Second. I'm a motion and a second. Any discussion? So the veterans agent, I believe, can speak to the clarification if we want to give her the floor for just a moment. Yep, please. Sure. Sue Magna, veterans director. Um, my concern, one of the concerns that came up was um, I have a veteran who is the commander of the VFW post here in North Reading. He was living here at one point and then moved to Tewksbury. Um, he wants to stay on the committee and um, with the, the way the guidelines are under Chapter 115, <clears throat> they look at it as a, it was too close to the perimeters, um, which would not allow uh, non-residents to be here. Um, and the committees that they're talking about is a committee that would actually be there to assist me in my regular duties. It's been, from the beginning, this, this committee was set up to basically work with the events, the outreach, and those kind of things for the veterans of the town um, and their families. It has nothing to do with the actual job itself in, within the office. So, and with it being labeled as Veterans Affairs Committee, it was too close to the federal name of Veterans Affairs. So, with that, Veterans Events Committee, in conjunction with, um, back and forth with the town attorney, um, this was a good suggestion. Thank you for explaining. Any more questions? Yes. Just the one I point out, I think that's something we discussed a few weeks back. I think it's important as people move out of town, whatever, as long as you have a nexus to the town, I think, you know, we thank every veteran for their service, and especially service on these types of committees. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as you have a nexus to North Reading, you should be able to serve on a committee. <clears throat> and I feel the same way. If it, I mean, and I know any veterans in here can say the same thing. You, you don't have to be belong to your VFW post in your town. They may not be doing a lot. You might want to be involved in one in another town and be on that and be on that um, on their committees so it, it doesn't have to, it shouldn't have to be enforced to be a, in my field a, a resident of the town if they're willing and they want to help out and do things thank you any more discussion on the board I'll take a vote all those in favor aye, aye. aye. unanimous Susan just so you know Kate's going to be giving the speech on Veterans Day. And the proclamation will be? Uh, Mr. Schultz, are you going to be able to give the proclamation that day? Well, I'm sorry, when is it? Saturday, 11, 11. Yeah, yeah, I could be there. Yep. Okay. Okay. Proclamation speech. All right, uh, next agenda item, we still have a few more minutes. I'll reaffirm the members of the Veterans Committee and appoint new members. Go right Mr. Chairman, I move to appoint the following individuals to the Veterans Event Committee. Uh, Neil Rooney III, Joseph Vino, Albert DeSalvo, uh, Richard Stratton, Arthur Cole, and Kenneth Ravioli. Second. Yeah, second. Do we have to do a roll call vote? No. Okay. okay. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Next. The minutes for October 16, 2017, regular session. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the October 16, 2017, regular session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the October 16, 2017, executive session minutes as written. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Approve the September legal bills. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve September legal bills in the amount of $13,115.26 as follows. Coltman and Page for general, $11,320.76. Coltman and Page for labor. $1,794.50 for a total of $13,115.26. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? 
None. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Do we need to set up anything for our 7.30? Yes. Okay. We'll take a moment to do that and uh, I'll just take a moment to talk to you. Okay, so this evening we're going to take a few moments to recognize our Minute Militia here in town. They provide such a, uh, a service to the community and it's been a long time coming for us to take a moment to recognize you and thank you for your service to the town. And I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Romeo and she's going to just give us a few words, maybe a little history and uh, just talk about the work that's been done and why we're here this evening. And then we have some, uh, some recognition certificates for you and Representative Jones also has few things he'd like to present and say. This is wrong. Um, I'm here um, representing the historical community and just to straighten that out for you, the histo historical community is widespread and so that there'll be no more confusion about that, there are several groups involved. So there is the historic, historical S society, which is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. It's a private organization which welcomes any and all <coughs> and uh, it has been in existence since the 1950s when the town celebrated its 100th anniversary. So that group has been thriving and going on and through generations and attempting to save artifacts and so forth. So um, that group is one. Then the town, during the United States Bicentennial, um, formed a historic commission, and that's a town board. It also formed a historic district commission, and that is to look over buildings that um, are in the center of town. It can be in other sections of town, and so that if a, a building needs to be renovated and it will uh, seriously change the appearance of that building to the detriment of the area, then the person doing the renovation should come before that board and discuss what the changes are and everyone comes to a good um, end and so forth. So those are three of the groups. So. Um, during the uh, bicentennial for the country, um, the historic society was really uh, concerned about continuing their work and trying to keep the Daniel Putnam House upright. The town had purchased that by eminent domain and they um, were falling on hard times trying to raise money. They had m managed to resurrect it with roof falling in and windows boarded up, but we had actually gotten two rooms open and were beginning to find a little success with it and were hoping that eventually, someday, we would get the property up and running and be able to have visitors and, and get school children in there and educate them about the history of the town. So we said we can't do it alone. We just can't get through this without more help. And so little by little, people started coming forward and other families began to get involved. 
And some families that come to mind were people like the Halls, and I know Gordon Hall is here tonight, and they came forward and they gave blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> along with others, my own family involved, and it, it was miraculous. And then suddenly the government said, we need groups to get involved and we need parades and we want you to become a national bicentennial community. And the Board of Selectmen said to me, will you chair up a bicentennial community group? And I, sa I said, well, yeah, but we can't give you any money. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know about that. So we went ahead and we formed a committee and we worked for three years and we wound up as, with a surplus of $85,000 at the end and we became a national uh, bicentennial community and we ran all kinds of things and this, this group of men in the process said, heck, we are going to resurrect the original militia that was in North Reading. We are going to reactivate the veterans group that was here. So talking about the veterans tonight, it, how appropriate is it that we're going to honor the original veterans group here? And they are still alive. They look a little different than they did there, but uh, <laughs> uh, they are still working, they're still defending the town, and they are doing wonderful things. They started out by rescuing a building on Main Street that was being torn down and being replaced by a liquor store. <laughs> and now it stands down in back of the Putnam House property and it is the schoolhouse from 1840 and that is used constantly for children to come in and see what school classes would have been like in North Reading. Okay, we still have that going. Then they came along and we found the bones of one of the original settlers' homes. Searched for it for years and finally found it by accident. And they resurrected that house and that house is standing today. And they bring the kids through that house and it's wonderful. Okay, so that was done. What else could they do? Well, they just went ahead and they were offered the uh, entrance or the beginnings of the first meeting house. And there it stood. It got dedicated this year. It's standing right there. But in the meantime, there was no grass growing under their feet. They went ahead and rescued all the farm implements and plows and tractors and you name it. And they built the farm museum and it's too small for all the things that they got offered to them. It's wonderful. I saw the children this spring walk into that and you could hear a pin drop. It was wonderful. They were awed by what they saw in that museum. They could not believe the implements that didn't run by computer. So. We have so much to be grateful for because of these guys that have put all of their efforts into educating the children on the past so that they will move into the future appreciating what the past has done for them. So go ahead and thank them for what they've done. We could not have done it without their wonderful help. So thank, thank you. you for thanking them. Well, thank you for giving us a quick overview on all the work they've done. Mr. Representative. I, think, I was going to say, I think Pat did a fantastic job uh, reciting the history and... Do you mind taking the microphone? Mind, no, no, we'll, we'll Just pass it down. Let's move it down. I was just going to say, I think, uh, I think Pat did a uh, tremendous job uh, reciting the history of the Minute Militia, and uh, anybody who spent uh, any time in town uh, certainly knows one or more of the members uh, and has seen them out and about 
sometimes in uh, more modern attire and sometimes in more historical attire. Um, actually, some of you we probably recognize more frequently in historical attire. Um, <laughs> but to think not only about this, but the effort that they put forward, the Memorial Day Parade, the Veterans Day celebration, uh, and just everything about town. Um, they really, uh, I think, help define the sense of community, uh, and I think as Pat touched on, uh, remembering the past uh, and instilling it in young people uh, so that they can go forward knowing what, what the roots, not only of the community, but the, the Commonwealth and the country as well. Uh, so uh, we're, we're fortunate. I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that you have a presentation, and I have a presentation for each, each member, and it, and it reads as follows. It's a small citation uh, from the House of Representatives, Office of Sincerest Congratulations to each member of the Minute Militia in recognition of your service to the North Reading community as a member of the North Reading Minute Militia. Uh, given the 6th day of November uh, 2017, signed by the Speaker of the House and myself, and uh, scared to think that uh, I'm rapidly approaching the age where I can be considered one of the relics of the town. Uh, mm -hmm. So I appreciate the, all the efforts to remember those relics uh, by, uh, by the, 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 the various groups and societies and, and thank um, the members of the Minute Militia. I know they've done a tremendous job. And, uh, as is often uh, the case, I have to give, uh, give the microphone over to the Senate who arrived. We've uh, stalled enough time. So the Senate's <laughs> arrived. Time is perfect. That's the role of the House. Um, so I'll turn the microphone over to Bruce. Bruce, why don't you come on up here? And Not that you usually need a microphone, but... Well, thank you very much, Representative, and uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to the members of the board. Uh, we've all just witnessed what the House is good at, which is filibustering, and so uh, happy to be here, and I wanted to allow enough time to uh, be able to, to have that happen. But uh, in all seriousness, I am uh, very pleased to be here with Brad in order to recognize the Minutemen uh, for all of the things that they do to remind us of the incredible history uh, that we have as a nation and how localized that history is right here in North Reading and whether that be the preservation of buildings or attendance at public events, uh, things like Veterans Day, or whether it be uh, always on hand to remind us of the legacy that we share as uh, members of this community and as people that uh, prize the history of this great nation. Uh, they are always there to fulfill that purpose and that is a very important purpose. And sometimes when those things happen year after year, uh, maybe they're not recognized as much as they should be. Uh, so I commend the board for uh, taking on that role of tonight, uh, providing that recognition. And uh, again, I'm pleased to be here with Brad uh, with a very uh, similar uh, citation from uh, those of us in the Senate uh, to make sure that uh, all of our members of the Minutemen know that we prize and value them and their efforts as well. So thank you for the opportunity to join you tonight uh, for this very important purpose. And this is the extent of the House and Senate agreement that you'll see over the next <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to read your proclamation? Absolutely. You may uh, note that this language sounds very familiar. You may have heard it just a few moments ago, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so these are from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the State Senate, their official citations at Reed. Uh, be it known that the Massachusetts Senate hereby extends its congratulations to the members of the North Reading Minute and Militia in recognition of your demonstrated and committed service to the town of North Reading, honoring veterans as well as preserving historic buildings, landmarks, and culture. And be it further known that the Massachusetts Senate extends its best wishes for continued success, that this citation be duly signed by the President of the Senate and attested to and a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the Senate. And uh, this is signed by uh, our Senate President, Stan Rosenberg. It's attested to by our clerk, William F. Welch. And I'm proud to offer all of these on November 6th of 2017. And I would suggest to Brad that maybe we want to save one of these because you have the, the uh, signature of the speaker and I have the signature of the Senate President. So maybe we can get some Maybe if there is no agreement, we can just move ahead with those signatures <laughs> <laughs> and move forward. But uh, so thank you. Well, thank Mr. you. What I'd like to do, if I could, is I'd like to read the names of the certificates that we have and then have each individual come up front. We'll hand you uh, each individual your, your certificates from the state and from the town, and then we'll take a quick photo, if that's okay. And while I'm reading, please make sure you take a look at these beautiful photos that were provided by the Minute Militia, and you can see all the work and activity that they've done here in town. And before I read the certificates, I just want to give my board members an opportunity to say anything before we call everyone up, if you wanted to say anything at all. Anybody, if 
not, we'll go right into the certificate. Job well done, everyone. Okay. Yeah, you guys have a real passion for what you do. Okay. It really shows. Okay. Excuse me. Yes, please. <clears throat> Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Stratton. I'm the uh, captain of the North Reading Minutemen. Actually, uh, I'm representing the current captain. I was captain for the last two years. I'm representing uh, Bill McDonald, who's the current captain, elected this year. And I just want to take the opportunity to um, have the members of the Minute and Militia stand up one by one and be recognized before we go through and go into the presentation. Um, I'd like to, uh, as, as um, Pat Romeo alluded, we began uh, this men and militia group. It was formed in 1974, prior to the uh, bicentennial. And um, it was formed by, uh, I, some of the original members are here tonight. So I want to recognize them as well as the uh, other members of our group. Um, I'd like to have Gordon Hall stand up. He was our original captain in 1974 and 75. I'd like to have Roy Walters stand up. He's one of our original members. I'd like to have Jeff, Jeff and Patty Bemis stand up. They're one of our original members. Patty was a member of Patty was a member of our uh, original dames, we called them. They would accompany us to all the parades that we participated in uh, during that time and over the number of years. And I'd also like to recognize um, John Richard. He's a past captain. And um, let me see, Tom Parker, currently an active member. Let me see, anybody else here that I missed? Okay, um, and myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, as Pat Romeo alluded to, um, we originally were formed to become uh, representatives of the original um, Minuteman group who went to Lexington and Concord uh, in, 19, in 1775. Uh, and we, in the original group, actually performed, um, fought against the British at, on Battle Road after the Concord and Re uh, Lexington um, engagement. So um, over the last, so we were formed in 74, and for the next 10 years, we basically uh, participated in um, various parades around the state, uh, different reenactments, and then, uh, we decided that it would be a good thing to um, get involved with uh, preservation of the buildings around the town and try to resurrect them and find them initially. Uh, I actually joined the group in 1985, and that was when um, I'd moved into town in 1981, actually. And uh, I heard about this group in 1984, and I actually saw a presentation at a local Boy Scout uh, group and uh, that's the reason why I joined. But when I joined, we were in the process of, uh, we had already taken, they had already taken down the, um, the original schoolhouse, and it was laying in the back of the historic district property there, behind the Putnam House, in a pile. And uh, so I, so that's when we decided to, I think it was around 1985, 1986, we decided to actually erect this building. So that started the whole process of uh, restoring the buildings, finding them, and erecting them. And as uh, Pat Romey alluded to, the most recent one is the uh, first meeting house for North Reading. So I welcome all of you um, in the future to come down and see the buildings if you haven't already <coughs> seen them. Uh, they're open during various times of the year. And the next time it'll, they'll be open uh, is um, on, um, let me see, it's the, um, Christmas tree lighting. It's the Christmas tree lighting, that's correct. So thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, letting me come up here and speak and recognizing my group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hall, please. Al 
from Advanced Photo did this for us today. And we could, I don't know if you would like to have it or not, but we could, we could give it to you if you wish, if you would have a place for it. I'm sure that there'd be a great location here in Town Hall for it. Okay. okay. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, uh, as I read your name, if you just come, come right up here in front of the desk, and once I get completed, we'll have the senator and the representative to join us, and we'll take a quick photo. But I'd like to read our certificate of recognition first. The Board of Selectmen in the town of North Reading are pleased to present this certificate as an expression of its high regard in recognition of faithful and conscientious service as valuable members of the North Reading Mi Minute Militia. Mr. Dick Bo Bowen. Okay, we'll get it to him. Joff Bemis. Jeffrey. Jeffrey Bemis. Front, Jeff. Tim Brooks. <laughs> Brad Brooks. <laughs> Michaela Griffin. Gordon Hall. Nick O'Brien. <laughs> Bill McDonald. Thomas Parker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie Peacock. <laughs> George Perry. John Richards. Roy Walters. Roy's the quiet one in the front row. Richard Stratton. And Ronald, is it Yakely? Yakel. Yeah, I'm going to 
No, I can, I can stare. You can stare. Congratulations. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. Because uh, I have a feeling the snow, sidewalk snow removal thing is going to take a little bit. Um, Mike, do you have five minutes to do the... 2019 budget process is that enough time that's I believe that's enough time yes so the board members should have in their packet a copy of a draft uh, excuse me of a working schedule for um, budget submissions and please bear with me while I thumb to the appropriate page here no there's plenty of seats up front that are sitting out the hallway if they want to come in Thank you. Which one are you? Oh. We're just going to go. So, so the folks, just quickly, so the folks that are here to discuss the sidewalk, we we have a 8 o'clock public hearing. We're going to do that and then go right to the sidewalk right after that. And that public hearing shouldn't take too long. So, Mr. Chairman, yes. through you, there is a fiscal year 19, 2019 budget calendar that is included in the package. Probably the first step that I should note is that the board's strategic plan was presented at the department head meeting this past Wednesday here at Town Hall. Thank you, Selectman Prisco, for joining us and for going through all of the slides. Um, that's intended to inform the departments as they submit their request for uh, their fiscal year 2019 operating budgets. Uh, their budget proposals are due to the Finance Department on December 14th. 
and uh, between December 14th and February 9th, the finance director and I will be meeting with department heads reviewing their requests and ultimately formulating the town administrator's recommended budget, which will be filed on February 9th with the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee. The first joint Board of Selectmen Finance Committee hearing is scheduled for <coughs> Saturday, February 24th here at Town Hall, and that'll be with the police, fire, and DPW. And then there are uh, four hearing dates that have been uh, preliminarily scheduled subject to the board's uh, approval of its final meeting schedule in March and April. And probably the most significant thing to note is that during the uh, budget process this year, we've asked departments to submit items that um, might not necessarily fall within the category of level services requests. Uh, in the past, we've asked departments to make uh, only level services requests um, and uh, in rare instances, there's been something that's stipulated something outside of that. Uh, we're asking departments to take a, uh, a more broad look, not only at their needs this year, next year, but also to look a few years out as well in terms of our long-term needs. It's a bit of a strange uh, ch a change in strategy for soliciting proposals. It does not necessarily change the landscape of where we stand right now financially in terms of affordability, but it uh, should prompt, I think, uh, healthy discussion amongst all of us, including the board, as we look at uh, the various things that might be on the radar um, now or potentially in future years. Uh, and again, uh, we are uh, looking at having the warrant close on March 19th and with the board to uh, take its final actions relative to the printed warrant on May 7th with town meeting tentatively scheduled for June 4th, subject to the board's approval at what will likely be either their first or second meeting in January. So that's just kind of the broad overview in terms of where things stand right now. Um, we'll continue to keep the board apprised as we go through the process. And uh, similar information was conveyed at the financial planning team meeting last Wednesday. Wednesday. Correct, Wednesday. Okay. Thank you. Very good. And did everybody in the, find it in your meeting packet? No, uh, it's a it's a one page document that falls right after the documents relative to the snow, uh, sidewalk snow removal okay. bylaw. It's a, just a single page document that's in there. Okay, all right. Um, let's see. Mr. Schultz, you have the public hearing notice. I so do. we're going to move to the next thing in the agenda, which is uh, the public hearing for Christopher's Market to transfer the package store wine and malt beverage license and it's officially 8 p.m. please uh, we're gonna read the public sta hearing statement for us great uh, we've noticed a public hearing in accordance with chapter 138 of the Massachusetts general laws a public hearing will be held by the Board of Selectmen in room 14 Town Hall 235 North Street on Monday November 6 2017 at 8 p.m. on the application of Devanesh Inc., DBA Christopher's Market for transfer of the annual wine and malt beverages liquor license. A license to be exercised at 2 Washington Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a one-story building, no cellar, one room for selling, one for storage, back room for office and supplies. Okay. Mr. Gilbert, do you want to start off with anything? Uh, just a brief notation. Um, you should see uh, in your Dropbox folder for tonight's meeting a separate file identified as this application. Um, there are a couple of components with it. Uh, there's a traditional ABCC language that's required. There was a cover letter that was submitted by the applicant when the application was filed, I believe in late September or early October. And we had a couple of questions as we went through our review. Uh, Ms. Brooks had reached out to, I believe it was yourself, uh, and you uh, were kind enough to respond to our questions with a written response and a letter, so we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, the board was given all of that information prior to tonight's hearing. And if you could just state your, sure. your name. Uh, my name is Attorney John Moradian, uh, Democus Law Offices in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, I represent Divyash Inc. Uh, <coughs> with me is Bikabai Patel, uh, Prashant Patel, and Nitin Patel. Uh, you understand. Um, they've entered a purchase and sale agreement to buy uh, Christopher's Market over on 2 <coughs> Washington Street from Shiva Enterprises. Um, Bigabai owns three other liquor stores, is very experienced in the business. Um, Prashant be his first store that he owns in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, Nitin is a manager of record, and um, he'll manage the store. He uh, manages Hunting the Market in Brighton, Massachusetts. 
done so for 17 years, runs a very clean store, very um, uh, well-run store, and there was a um, service to minor violation, which I outlined in the letter to the board, uh, what happened. Um, just full disclosure, to date we have no response or a letter from the city of Boston yet as of what's going to happen with, with that license or any, any sort of um, uh, punishment or, or suspension or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> what we're seeking today is approval of transfer to DBR Shank and approval as Nitton's manager of, of the uh, license. I'll accept any, uh, any questions you may have regarding the application. Uh, any board member have any question, Mr. Schultz? Yeah, uh, if you could just elaborate on the, the violation. Yeah, so, uh, Nitton, could you come, actually come forward and get some questions? Um, like I said, Nitton manages uh, Huntington Market, which is down in Brighton, kind of near Boston College area, and a uh, underage, I presume student at this point, uh, utilized a fake ID. Nitton does use a scanner in his store, scanned it, scanned it, did not pick up the, um, Fake ID. The fake ID. Uh, immediately, uh, the police came in, talked to Nitton. He was very cooperative with, with the, um, the police there. We're still awaiting word from the city of Boston, their licensing board, what's going on there. <coughs> but in terms to prevent anything further going on, Nitton installed a up-to-date scanner system. It's a $4,500 system. Updates annually to try and catch the technology these days with fake IDs to try and protect against uh, future incidents like this. Was this a sting operation? It was not a sting. It was just uh, the kid came in, and the, the police were there and happened to see it, and they and they. Um, Do we know how old the uh, minor was? It was uh, might be uh, twenty years old. Okay. Any idea why the police stopped them? It just seems odd to me. Uh, I have no idea. Might be there is. A, I heard that uh, they have a lot of uh, checking on the area, and I own the store more than uh, two thousand four. We never have a pro uh, any problem in a even cigarette license either. Yeah, it just happened. Maybe the police were walking by. I saw a kid with beer near PC. That could be. That could be it. Because of the students area, we were always careful. Okay. Mr. O'Leary. Just as far as I say, so you're going to be the manager of record. What are your hours going to be there? Or is someone else going to be there most of the time? Or how much I time have you assistant to manager. Okay, so he'll be there primarily most of the time? Right, yes, sir. And again, tips trained? Yep, he is tips trained. I guess, yes. And he will be tips trained before, store, before they transfer the store to him. Any more? Are you all set? That's good. This is Minya Pelly. Who else are you going to be using as employees there? As current people, or is there going to be some sort of a shift of employees, um, just the two of you, or who? who just me and Prasant right now. Are we full time? He's going to be the full time, yes. Full time is a lot of hours there, though. Well, uh, well currently there's two guys working, so they'll be there. Okay, so I believe that was your, your question. Right. Are, oh, are yeah. they the same people that are already working there? Yes, yes. yes, yes are, sir. are they TIPS trained? Uh, yes. Yes, they're required to be. Any more questions? Just one follow up. Yes. Um, I, I know how Christopher's looks right now. What are you planning to do differently with the store? Anything or? Uh, might be we change a little bit uh, coolers or everything and. Uh, the same product mostly? Same product, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. I, I just uh, would like to acknowledge the, uh, the disclosure to have the more recent violations, and again, that's a, that's a pretty good track record for the number of years you were there and haven't had any other violations, but I appreciate the disclosure up front. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I've learned it's better to be safe than sorry, Kate, especially if we didn't disclose it, it comes back to you guys two weeks later, it's not a good. <laughs> yeah, we get a little angry about that. Yeah. No, no, I really do appreciate the, uh, uh, the disclosure up front. And, uh, and uh, again, I plan on voting in favor of the transfer and wish you much success, and thank you for all your years of service to the community, and I mean, a good member of the business community. Uh, Mrs. Minupelli. I, I just wanted to get back a little bit more to the violations which you're required to disclose in your application. It looks like there were three beginning in 2016. So, so 
How many of these establishments do you currently own? One or two other retail establishments? He, he owns uh, Shiv Quick Pick, which is Huntington I'm Market I'm in Brighton, Massachusetts. So that's another establishment, another establishment. that's sold to minors, right? Twice. Not right. once. Just once, and this is the first. And then there's, a, there's an establishment in Revere. Mina Patel's a director, and she's only on here. Um, she's not an employee, she's just a director. No ownership interest whatsoever, and she owns um, partial owner of two stores, but one store in Revere, rather, that had two violations in one uh, 18 months, rather. Um, I'll give you the exact name of it. It is um, Parkway. Shubon Court, uh, it's Parkway Convenience in Revere. Right, so I, I'm just thinking that that's quite a few sales to minors um, in one small mm -hmm. given time. And basically the first should be the last. So what are you going to do differently? It doesn't seem like anything differently was done with three repeat. It's not like it's 10 years apart or five years apart. It's within the same year, three right. and basically within the year's time. So I, that's a massive concern. Nitin is, is the manager of record. He's going to be working day-to-day -day operation with Prashant. Mina Patel, who had the other store in Revere, is just the director of the corporation. She's not involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the store. She won't work there. She's not an employee there. She's simply a, a director for purposes of the application. I, I don't think, I, I think my question is more specifically, what are you going to do oh. not to do that here? Because that is a major concern mm -hmm. here. What are you going to do differently than maybe this manager that you're not going to, she's going to have a beneficial interest in, but she's not going to be there. What, what, they're is, gonna, what they're are you going to do? Install the up-to-date scanner I mentioned earlier. It's about $4,000, $5,000. The updates annually, they're going to scan. It requires you to scan an ID when you, it's a point of sale ID scanner. So you scan a, a bottle of wine, it requires you to scan an ID in order to run the transaction through. So that's their main um, main way of uh, preventing snapping again. And when is that going to be installed? Before they It'll be installed when they, when they close on the store. He, he, okay. His violation happened early October, the next day he had it installed. So I just installed the very next day. I said, I took his demo even. I said, I'm not going to be wait two more days or four more days. I need your demo right now. I write the check. Here you go. Give me your demo. Okay, because that's good, I think. Because, because uh, that's, uh, we are very strict about this thing. We don't like any to sell anything to underage, anybody. So, I, if I could, I mean, these violations were they Massachusetts IDs or out of state IDs? It was out of state ID. So that's the biggest problem with college students because they can go online that, and buy them. Yes. Um, and so I would, I mean, we can't tell you what to do, but it's certainly if you have a policy and procedure not to allow any out of state license to sell alcohol to young people in this town, <coughs> I think you, you know based on the track record that I see would make me feel a little bit better. But I can't tell you how to do your job, but it certainly would make me feel a lot better. We don't have a lot of visitors coming into town from all over the world, so I don't think it will reduce your business, but I certainly think it will help you keep from having this problem in this town. Um, we have a lot of college students in this Correct. town. Correct. So yeah, we understand that. Yes, sir. I'm just making it as a recommendation. Uh, yes. I think training. that may. And also, yeah. that, that there's a lot of kids after school that actually congregate in that right. area. Yes. And they come and visit that Reason, area. Yes. Yeah, the, right. the challenge is these IDs are so good now, and they scan. It's, and this ID Even checker, excuse me, sorry about that. This ID checker check 14 different ways, so nobody can fool around. And they update every month, every single month they no, update. Excuse me, does forensic check? So in three seconds, is checks come back to us. It's great. Yes, yeah, just two questions on the technology. I think that's great. Yes. Uh, do you have a plan in place every so many months to update the technology? Because you know the criminals always make the IDs part faster. Of the, part of the service updates monthly, I believe, or even. They bi charge monthly. sixty dollar a month, yep. and they update every single month. And if you catch somebody with a if the license comes back bad and you don't know why it's bad, what do you do at that point? We just take it out and we say, I'm sorry, we cannot sell you. Yeah. Do you this give them the license back? back? No. Nope. Okay. That's it. Done.
Okay. Any other questions? And I'll take a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to transfer the package store wine and malt beverage license held by Shiva Enterprises, Inc., DBA Christopher's Market, to Divianche, Inc., DBA Christopher's Market, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. I have a second, have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Best of luck to you thank and to you. you. Retiring? No. No. <laughs> 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 you, you hit a Boy, he was you, you had a winning that. lottery ticket? <laughs> no. Uh, oh. <laughs> Good luck. Best of luck. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Okay. Mr. Globerto, we are now uh, at this part of the agenda where we're going to discuss the sidewalk removal plans and vote on the betterment order. And I just want to make sure everyone in the crowd understands I'm not trying to be difficult, but this is not a public hearing. And I really would like to hear from you all, but we do have a long, long agenda. But I will say that there are more of you tonight than we've had on this subject. And I've been here since 2010. And I voted against this bylaw all the way up till this particular year when no one showed up for the multiple public hearings we had on this subject. And then none of you were at town meeting. None of you that I can remember. So, um, and I just want to make sure it's clear. This board did not approve this. We put it forward for recommendation to town meeting, and the town's people voted this in. So it's at the control of the town. This is what the voters voted in. Now, what our job this evening to do is to put together the betterment order, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. So if any of the board members want to say anything before we get started, feel free. But I'd like to get... Yes. Just, Mr. Chairman, briefly, w and we, we've also, this issue has come up repetitively, and it already is the responsibility under our bylaw for the property owner to remove the snow. So this is just a little something to, to tackle it um, in a different way if, if the DPW has to go out and, and remove the snow. So it's just a slight change that then allows them to remove it and then lien the property owner for the expense associated with it. But it already was uh, under the bylaw, the responsibility of the owner to remove. Yeah. I mean, it is a flawed bylaw. We all know that because we have a lot of sidewalks to nowhere. But you know, that's why we had public hearings, and that's why we try to come up with the best way to, to handle this. Um, and I believe it's, is it 48 hours or 24 hours after a snowstorm? It has to be cleared. 24 hours after 20 the snow ends. After the snow ends. So, um, you know, we're not looking for you to be out there two, three, four times during a storm. 24 hours after the, s the snow ends, and that's, yes. Do you want to say? Right. So just a, a clarification. So we've been working with town council on this bylaw, uh, it seems, for multiple years now at this point in time. But at this point, we're, we're looking at trying to obtain some some direction relative to the enforcement and while the agenda states that there would be a vote on an actual betterment order the final vote on the betterment order um, well, the final the final vote to assess the cost to the property owner as a lien would be conducted by the board at the conclusion of the winter season and after 30 days have elapsed since DPW has sent a bill to the property owner so um, it's a little different than for example, a betterment for uh, uh, another type of infrastructure project like wastewater or water, where you would give somebody the notice with the estimated costs, and then you would send them a final assessment at the very end. So why this is important is because it, it's directly related to how we enforce the, boy, the bylaw as it exists. And uh, we wouldn't want to go out and remove the snow, um, incur the cost of removing the snow, which will be in addition to what we already incur for costs for snow removal in town um, as it is, uh, and then have the board indicate in May, June, or whenever that we don't want to assess that cost because then we'll have expended funds without, well, unknowingly expended funds that we were not going to recover. So the purpose for tonight's discussion, as I indicated at the last meeting three weeks ago, is to seek that uh, initial um, authorization from the um, 
from the board relative to the enforcement. And we've had a lot of conversation with the DPW director, with the police chief, and ultimately the goal in enforcing in this fashion is to um, to get the snow cleared from the sidewalks. And uh, you know, I heard the comments earlier, and we certainly I, I understand the concern. Certainly, um, we're in the the difficult situation of having a, a bylaw that dates back some 13 or more years, and uh, trying to enforce it. I, I guess the one thing that I would note is for the property owner who removes the snow from the sidewalk from one end of their property to the other, this wouldn't have an impact on that person who wouldn't have to remove the snow from that from that property. So there is a sort of relief, so to speak, from it. It's not as if we're going to come out and we're going to remove the snow regardless. It would only be implemented in a situation when the snow was not removed from the sidewalk. So that was a little more than I wanted to say, but that's pretty much, I think, all of it. <laughs> Mrs. Benupelli. So that, I had two questions about that, actually, if I could ask Tate, because I think Mr. O'Neill's point was well made, so that do we address these at the end um, one by one so that a, perhaps a property owner who had an issue, for example, like he has maybe with the snow being plowed and high, you know, huge snow banks onto, back onto the sidewalk that he's already cleared off or up and down 28, um, sleet, sleet and slush and ice getting plowed back onto the sidewalk. Would he be able to address the board at the time that we take the vote on an assessment? Or are we just doing them all at once? Like, for example, the grid that we... So the, the, so the grid is actually an attachment to the, the, the vote um, that we're asking the board to authorize and, and would be utilized as a tool when the order is recorded. But the intention is to record what to proceed with mailing the assessment at the end of the winter season. So looking at the administrative oversight, the uh, overhead that would be required to assess and bill on a per storm basis, the, the, the practical aspect of it is we've seen over the past few years that these storms come back to back to back. And often it's difficult to untangle one storm from the other. Um, so, you know, it could be that we get back to back snowstorms and we just never have an opportunity to get out there at the end of the first one and we don't get there till the second one. Um, th does that answer your question or no? Well, not exactly, because I think I'm looking for, and I think when we've been talking about this over and over and over again, I, again, we're, we're talking about a few properties that d simply don't clean the sidewalk. We're not talking, to my understanding, we weren't talking about the majority of businesses along 28. So I thought it was just a select few that really caused a safety concern that people w had to veer out into the road to navigate, pedestrians had to veer out into the road. But I think what I'm looking for is, uh, let's say someone had a legitimate explanation or a legitimate reason, is there going to be a chance for them to come and talk to us um, prior to the assessment being issued? Or are you just looking for the blanket authority to just say once it's done, it gets assessed and there's no middle? So, so my concern with that would be First, obviously, the, the timeliness of needing to respond quickly to remove the snow because of the safety issue that's created. But the, the secondary issue, I, I didn't envision a scenario where, um, well, there needs to be another vote of the board. So anybody can show up in front of the board to try to indicate any comment. And if they're recognized by the chairman, I'm, sur I'm sure that, that they could speak. But ultimately, I didn't envision a situation where it would be where, where there would be much in dispute. We'd have somebody out there, whether it's a police officer or a foreman or the DPW director himself, documenting it. And, and there are, make no mistake, there are properties where the sidewalk doesn't get touched. But the more common thing that happens is the snow gets piled at the end of the property, just like many of us shovel our driveways, and it creates an obstruction. And that's probably the biggest obstacle that DPW will face in, in, in plowing the snows, but I, plowing the snow. But I, I don't... I didn't envision a scenario, and I'm not sure, and I'm looking kind of to the DPW director back there. I don't recall there being a relief mechanism, so to speak, coming from town council either on it. Correct. Um, I, I don't recall any discussion from town council. <coughs> you good? Yes. Uh, Mr. Schultz and then Mr. O'Leary. Uh, uh, Mr. Gilberto, what is the, our current plan for the residential areas and also the areas of sidewalk that it may be a butt conservation land that don't what are we doing right now with that? So uh, our protocol as the DPW director can certainly correct me if I misspeak, but um, w after we have finished plowing all of the town's roads, 
including the unaccepted roads, many of which we plow as well. Um, we'll go back and we'll conduct uh, basically pushing back of intersections and otherwise cleaning up the snow removal. And then after that's been completed, oftentimes it's been 24 to 36 straight hours of plowing and a rest period is called for in order for operators to safely use the equipment. They then go back and they'll do snow and sidewalk removal um, in and around the schools. Now, depending upon the school schedule, um, we may have no choice that they have to work straight through and utilize sidewalk snow removal equipment to take care of the walking paths. Um, the school issue is a combination of things. In the town center, there's multiple municipally owned properties where we would be responsible anyway mm -hmm. for the removal. So we're, we're addressing multiple issues by removing the snow from the sidewalk in those areas. And then there are identified walking paths um, in and around the outlying elementary schools where we also do the removal. Um, that generally happens fairly quickly. Uh, when I look at the, I'm again looking at the DPW director, that's probably happening somewhere between 48 and 72 hours after the snowfall is ended. Um, when we have a really bad winter like we did in 2015, uh, it became much more problematic where we just, there was too much snow for us to move. You put in snow on top of snow and, and that's why you saw the resulting cost projection, which basically called for the removal of the snow, which means we have equipment out there lifting it off the sidewalk, putting it in a dump truck, and trucking it away. And who would do, like, in front of the, the con residential condominiums on 28, and even that area across from Walmart that's, I would call it conservation land? Or so we do that. There's, okay. a con there's a conservation parcel opposite there that we, as I understand it correctly, we drive a, um, and th this is the, the difficulty, we drive town owned equipment up Main Street. It plows the sidewalk where we own the land and where we're responsible for it. Um, in the past, there were three homes that were resident, single-family residential homes that we may have plowed along the way uh, getting up there. Um, but where there's town-owned land, we, we are, try to be on top of getting that snow removed fairly quickly. North Street's another example. What about in front of, like, Greenbrier? Um, so uh, I'm looking to the DPW director for the Greenbrier example. That I'm, I'm, that I'm not sure offhand Greenbrier on. Greenbrier Park. There is, there is a, yeah. I know there is a stretch at Greenbrier that the town does do right near Plymouth Road, if I remember correctly. I guess my, my point of this is, and thank you, and I know you're just trying to implement what the voters put through. Mm -hmm. This whole bylaw has been flawed from the start, and I was against it before we put it at town meeting, and I argued against it at town meeting, and Mr. Prisco is correct. There really wasn't anyone from the business community that had showed up on this issue for quite some time, and certainly predates my time on the board as well. The intent of the bylaw is to have a clean sidewalk from Andover to Reading, and we all agree that's a good idea. But the problem you have with this, the way it's written is you have areas that are commercial, areas that are residential, areas that are neither, and areas that don't even have sidewalks. So even if every commercial business does what they're supposed to do under this bylaw, you're still not going to have a clean sidewalk from point A to point B. My opinion, the businesses pay taxes. I own a commercial property in town. I also own residential property. You know, living here, I have two kids in the schools, so I'm getting something out of my tax bill. Commercial property owners, they don't get trash service, they don't put kids in the school, but yet they're paying the same taxes. I think as a town, we want to be business friendly. We owe it to them. Now, again, we're here tonight because the town put this through. I would certainly impress upon the business communities to band together, try to get something on the next town meeting to override this bylaw. Because right now, this bylaw is law. There's really very little we can do about it right now. But I, I just think if we want to be business friendly and encourage economic development, you know, Reading plows for their businesses, Burlington plows for their businesses. Most towns do. And I think, you know, you're also looking at your, I think Mr. O'Neill, it might have been you or Mr. Hash, I'm not sure, but you're looking at two, two lanes of slush, snow, slop that by the time you guys are getting to it, it's frozen over. And most of the people that plow these mom and pop's driveways, they don't have the equipment to do sidewalks. So you got to hire somebody who does, and it just gets passed on to the business owner. And I just think this whole thing needs to be scrapped. That's been my opinion from day one. But right now, it's on the books. The town voted in. I think the business community should get together at the next town meeting, try to do something about this. That would be my advice. But again, no one did show up the last couple of times. So that's why we're where we are today. Any board members? Anything else? I yes. If you, uh, can you grab the mic, though? Do you mind? Um, Abby Hurlbut, Chairman, North Reading Finance Committee. Um, has the Board of Selectmen uh, in, uh, have any idea of what the cost of, quote, policing the sidewalks is? And by that I mean, okay, it snows all night long, and at some point somebody's got to go out and say, well, which sidewalk got plowed, which one didn't, who do we have to 
put on the uh, agenda for billing in the spring. Um, it, and there's a cost involved in that. There's further a cost in uh, doing the end of the year recap of betterment costs for the people that did get their sidewalk plowed. Do we have any um, idea what the cost of uh, doing it this way or for that matter any other way is going to be? Mr. Gilbert. So uh, presently the in enforcement via fine is conducted by the police department and in, in most instances they're able to do that using the on-duty um, staffing uh, for it. So in, in most instances we're able to do it with whoever is on duty without having to call somebody in for an additional cost. So we're dedicating a resource obviously from the police department to go out and evaluate the condition of these sidewalks and I think we, do, we were doing a warning and then issuing the first fine and issue a second fine. So it was requiring multiple visits to go and do that. So it, it was more so a consumption of time for the police officer, but more importantly, wasn't getting the sidewalks removed in some, sidewalks snow removed in some instances. In many instances, you know, we did have compliance, which we certainly were very happy about. But in, in some instances, all the visits in the world weren't going to get the snow removed. And that doesn't address the safety issue that we're concerned about given the number of high density housing developments that are on Main Street. With regard to the cost of this system, uh, you know, we are going to be looking at a significant administrative overhead and I believe the DPW director put a factor in his cost evaluation to include that. Um, no different than we would do, for example, with a police detail um, and maybe more aggressive than that because of the fact that it's more complicated. So th there is a cost associated with it, but the, the, the way we've developed the program, the entirety of that cost would be included in the assessed cost back to the, ultimately the property owner. Have I answered your question through you, Mr. Chairman? So if there's a few members of the audience that hasn't had a chance to get up and say anything, I'll give you an opportunity now. Um, give it a few more minutes, but I mean, it's kind of unfortunate where we've come down this road so far and we finally have some concern uh, commercial property owners. I, I've voted against this every year that I've been here until this year when no one was around. So, Can I speak? Please. Name and address, please. Sure. Uh, Peter Simblaris, McIntyre Drive, uh, resident of uh, North Reading, also a business owner in Reading, uh, currently sit as a board of director member of the Chamber of Commerce, North Reading and Reading Chamber of Commerce. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize that we weren't, a, as a chamber, ahead of this. Um, we're trying very hard to uh, work with the town of North Reading so that we can be ahead of these issues in the future. Um, I wasn't aware of you know the town meeting that's been going up and we should have been uh, so hopefully going forward we will be um, that being said um, after examining this um, I think it's going to be a nightmare for the town to try to enforce this um, your operational challenges I understand those people piling stuff up that has to be corrected as far as people trying to um, the business community and the residents on Main Street trying to clean those sidewalks it's almost impossible. You know, plows go by on a Friday night, snow comes in, it freezes up, by Monday morning they come back, nobody's going to be able to move that. Um, in Reading, I spoke with the head of the highway department, <clears throat> what they basically do is they get the guy on the bobcat, they get that um, V nose on the front of it, a couple of cups of coffee, and they send them off down the, sideway, down the sidewalks. No police details, no DPW backup. Now obviously if people are piling the snow, that's a different issue and that needs to be addressed. Um, basically, that's where we're at with this. Again, I apologize on behalf of the Chamber that we weren't ahead of this. In the future, we will try to be. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Shanna Cahalan. I'm a Vice President at Reading Cooperative Bank. We're located on Park Street in North Reading. Uh, I'm also Vice President of the Chamber uh, of Commerce here in Reading and North Reading. Um, I, I do know that, the, that it's been voted in by the residents here, but I think the issue that I'm most interested in is that the uh, cost projections are excessive and they're just unmanageable for the small businesses. Um, the increase is really steep and they're gonna pose drastic challenges. Uh, to a lot of the businesses. So to echo what some of my um, other fellow businessmen have said here, I think the business, uh, the burden is too large. 
Um, we are taxpayers, and so we've, uh, we're trying to, to do our part. Uh, but it's, it's unreasonable and dangerous. So thank you for your time, and good evening. Good evening, uh, Eric Evans, 3 Sandra Lane, um, resident of town, taxpayer, also a, uh, I run a business over on Fort Lowell Road. Um, my concern on this whole thing, you know, being a flawed, a flawed bylaw is that um, the removal process or the actual um, task at hand is, is flawed and that the only type of equipment you can usually to use down on those the streets along 28 here is a, a sidewalk plow and none of the business owners have access to that, only the towns have access to that type of equipment. So you're asking to perform a ta the business owner to perform a task that they really can't even perform uh, based on that removal. I mean, it may be a small storm, a few inches, you know, that might be a shoveling job, but you know, when the state comes in and decide, when the snow builds up too much and they decide to clear the sidewalks themselves, or the sides, they put the snow everywhere. And they can even put the snow back on the sidewalks. And that could be 72 or, you know, four days after the storm, so I don't think the bylaw even addresses that because the sidewalks will be back to being a mess again. So what I look for is a partnership with the town to, when the, when the snow gets to a certain level, the town has to step in and help um, you know, provide the equipment uh, or the process to do it versus finding everybody and, and billing it and all the extra cost of that. So that's my two cents. <coughs> Pat Lee, 22 Aspen Road. Um, a couple of questions, and I don't know if you plan to answer them now or wait till we're done and address them later, but who's deciding what is clean, what is suitable? So in most instances, it's going to be the DPW through the foreman or the DPW director. So are we within a half an inch of the pavement? Are we within an inch? Is it within... 24 hours, but if it slushes up in 36, we don't comply. How does, where does this, how does this work? While the DPW director is approaching, I don't envision it being any different than it is now, <laughs> which is the police department goes out there and they do a, conduct an evaluation and if it looks like the snow has been cleared, they make a determination has been cleared, they don't issue a fine. But I'll, I'll defer to the DPW director. Right, and, and I think that's clearly uh, something we're going to have to kind of look at. Um, we will probably be working in conjunction with the police department. Um, they've been involved in this over the last few years, obviously. So, um, you know, between their their determination, myself and our general foreman would be out there um, in conjunction with the police. If, if there's something that's deemed unsafe, that's causing people to either travel back out on, walk back out onto the road or not be able to get down the sidewalk, then, then that would be a concern. Okay, so if it's reasonably done, but if you're out plowing for the 24, 48 hours and then you're doing other sidewalks around schools and other properties, are we still, is that the point in time when it needs to be cleaned or? I just, I, to me so, it's very so gray and I, I just, right. I'm hearing numbers where we can get assessed four figures. I, 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 I'm just here to say I haven't seen it, but a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, is that correct? Well, so I think, I think, yours, I is, tell I think yours is close to fifteen hundred, depending upon a, about a twenty-inch storm. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit more then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but fourteen um, ninety-seven forty-six. <laughs> okay, but uh, so it's a serious number to me, and so I think this needs to be pretty clear, and. So that's what I'm hoping we can get to is some clarity on this or else, you know, I, I'll, be, I'll be back here with a lot redder face than I have right now uh, if I'm getting fined on what I thought was meeting the criteria. And, but then again, it may not have because it's such a gray area. So um, just based on the bylaw to answer at least some of that question, um, the current uh, bylaw states any time after 24 hours after the, after the storm starts. Um, depending on our work schedule would depend on when we would get out there, um, but it, it would not be any sooner than 24 hours at the, after the end of the storm. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the cost, so there, were, there was a range of costs that were um, put together based on town council's guidance. 
Um, we were, we were uh, counseled to, to cover all varieties of storm, or any variety of a storm, which is clearly not a, a simple thing to do because this is New England. We have storms that we've never had before that seem to show up. Um, the ranges ran anywhere from $1.33 a linear foot to $8 a foot based on what type of storm it was. A, a two inch snowstorm is significantly different than a 20 inch snowstorm, as is a six back to back five inch snowstorms. So it, it, it clearly is a, a wide range, but the intent was we, our personnel would be out there, whether it's myself or the general foreman or whoever it is, um, would determine what level of effort it took to remove that snow and that cost would be based on that level of effort. Um, as compared to just a standard number. It would, it would be based on what we really needed to, to remove the snow. So the fine kind of depends on what it would cost you to remove it. I don't believe it's referred to as a fine. Okay. What so, to, so just Please. to be clear about the nomenclature here, we're not talking about fines. We're talking okay. about assessing the actual cost of removing the snow. And two, three weeks ago, we provided an estimate based on a 20-inch storm. The reality is that the town can only assess the actual cost associated with the removal. And that actual cost includes the equipment involved, the manpower involved, the administrative oversight involved, and the finance office. So it, there will be a range, definitively. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you won't, you, you, we can't, I, we can presume, I think, that it's proportionally related to how much snow is on the sidewalk. I think that's a fair presumption. Yeah. Nobody likes this, okay? I mean, no. It's clear. No right. one likes it. Nobody ain't sitting up in these chairs like it. Mm -hmm. But the residents want a walking route on 28. That's what they came to the town meeting for. That's what they stated, and that's what they voted for, the majority. And that's what we're dealing with. So we're, you know, this is uncharted territory for us, so we're trying to work through it. And, you know, if every business would just take care of their own, then we won't have to we worry about this. But we know that's not reality either. So and, and I'll say to, and the point was made earlier, but it's not like we really have a contiguous sidewalk anywhere. And I'll just stay no my, li my little world. You can come off the lights of North Street, yep. and I've done a pristine job on my property, and then you don't see a sidewalk until you're pretty darn close down to Walgreens. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you skip and you, well, we don't have to go all the way up, but you get it. So you're now... If I've done my job, they still have to go out on the street. Or they have to cross the street to, we'll say, the east side, mm -hmm. where it's a little bit better. But No, we agree. It was discussed at town meeting, and, and people still voted in favor of this bylaw. Mr. Gilboro. So just a couple of pieces of clarity. It's an excellent point. So first, we, we talked with town council, and the town does not have the legal authority to remove the snow on a sidewalk that is not has not been constructed. So sounds like an oxymoron, but the grass patch that you see in front of some of the properties, we don't have the authority to go in there and remove the snow there and then assess the cost. We could remove the snow and not assess the cost, but I think that's highly unlikely to occur given the potential risk to damage equipment. So that's the first piece. The second thing that I, I want to reiterate is the intention would be to apply this in any instance where there is a constructed sidewalk. So the vagaries of some of what you see on, on, uh, on Route 28 are areas where the, the line between the sidewalk and the parking lot is very difficult to delineate. So there's a portion that's in the public way that actually is a sidewalk, even though it may not necessarily be made of cement and differentiated from the pavement. But it's on a state right of way that, under which the town has the authority to remove the snow. Conversely, there may be a constructed sidewalk that's clearly there with a curb and all, and a very clear and walkable parking lot where we would still be requiring the snow to be removed from the sidewalk, unfortunately. So, and I know there's a particular instance of this that might be in the room here, but I, mm -hmm. I advise us accordingly. I'm familiar with one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and again, and, and I'm going to echo the point. You know, I, I feel like I'm the deliverer of bad news here, and I am. But the fact of the matter is it's not. I guess no I argument. No <laughs> argument here. No one disagrees. But I don't enjoy the, the, the situation. I don't enjoy the position. I mean, we, we, we've tried, I think, in many other ways to be supportive of the business community to the extent that we can with the limited resources we have. So it is frustrating. The good news in this is for any property that removes the snow from the property, from their, from their sidewalk, or any property that's able to, this wouldn't have any impact because the snow would have been removed. That's the one piece of good news I can relay. Mm -hmm. But that brings with it its own and challenges. Steve, you made reference to what 226 Main Street would be assessed? Yeah. Yeah. So how is that base? That's what 
Okay. I'll have the, I think that was based is on it, a 20-inch store. I have 200 feet of frontage, but 70 feet of sidewalk. Am I getting assessed for 200 feet of frontage so, or 70 feet of sidewalk? So when we did the assessments, we looked at actual sidewalk, not frontage. Actual defined si sidewalk. So I don't, I, I don't have the individual properties. 170 I, feet of sidewalk. Wrong. 70 feet of sidewalk, or 100 feet off. Well, then your costs will go down. Yeah, thank you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gilberto. So, again, this is the, one of the nuances that I, I want to make sure we're all aware of. So you have curb cuts at your property, which mm -hmm. are included in that. Right? That's, a, that's a curb cut in the public way where the p pedestrian needs to be able to travel. So that, that may or be contributing clean. to this. It's going to be clean anyway. I would well, yeah, I'm assuming that's that's clean. Yeah, yeah, I'm assuming. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm still going to be assessed for that? Even depending upon no the sidewalk, then? depending upon its condition. No, not if it's no, not if it's not if it's clean and passable. That's Under this motion, it is. No, not no, it, no, no, it it's isn't. Not. Yeah. No, no. If it's clean. Because they're going to be out there doing assessment. If he does most of the work, but not all of it, the remaining piece, my understanding is you're going to clear it, and that remaining piece right. will be documented, and that's what's going to get charged. But the levy's going to be off, like what Mr. Lee's saying, the levy's going to be off his total frontage, not off his actual sidewalk under this particular motion. So uh, if that's, if it sounds like there's a formula that's already put that's together. That's based on for, the formula based on the frontage and the, frontage and the uh, length of sidewalk that's currently in front of him in case you don't clear it all. But, you know, in some of these instances, you know, the sidewalk may be clear, but again, at the end of the sidewalk, end of the property, snow plows, you know, pushed it up, and the only thing that may need to be removed is that portion of the, the snow banking, I would assume, and then that's what, right. the, that's what the assessment would be based upon. What equipment was used? How long were they there? How many right. man? What was the man right. hours? And then it would be for the whole, whole nine that's years. That's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah, so it would just be actual, your snow plow guy actual. locked the rest of the sidewalk going down, cleared your property, but... Uh, left your neighbor who didn't clean it, uh, be some shared costs there. So it's not necessarily the whole. Okay. Can, can, can we, to that, that's a very important question, Mr. Chairman, to you. Yes. Can we confirm with the DPW director that that's how you foresee it being implemented, meaning the partial removal would be reflected in cool. the noted expense? Correct. The intent would be whatever portion of the sidewalk still okay. has snow on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I know you want to move along. I just have one last question. So if I send my employee out to clear the sidewalk to live up to the town's bylaw on what I think is state-owned property, not town-owned property. Correct. And my employee gets injured enacting the town bylaw on state property, who's liable if something like that ever happens? You are. Or if your employee doesn't, that? if your employee doesn't do a good job too, well, that's a workers' comp issue you're talking about. But as far as the other issue is, if somebody slips and falls on something your guy did, can they sue the horseshoe? Correct. Well, yeah, um, and that's you so. Know. So I, I thought I was told if if you touch it, you own it. I think that's fair. So why why do I even want to touch it? What if somebody did slip? It may be a hell of a lot more expensive to me than cleaning the thing. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I, 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 I can't. this is crazy, but I. You know, if we, we had all these discussions, we did. We met, we've been in this room a thousand times on but this. But do you, tonight. It's flawed. Everyone's tonight, do you need to make this decision with these we sort of questions ha hanging? Yeah, we don't have a choice. Do no. we, you have to tonight. We have There's to. No, Selectman can't put this off for another day. Your customers came to town meeting and voted this in. Your customers. Okay? They voted this in. If you have an issue with them, you should talk to your customers because they voted this in. There's nothing we can do. We have to do this. We don't have a choice. If, like Mr. Schultz said, you guys want to get together, rally, come back in June, come up with a new warrant article, we readdress it, feel free. You're absolutely welcome to do so. But I've been dealing with this since 2010. And I have been in these meetings myself. Uh, I, uh, have I didn't see it. I not, didn't see not, it. This is when I was in the chamber. Well, we're not going to go down no, what I did, not. but I'm as frustrated as you are. I really am. This is, but this is crazy. Why would I even want to touch it then? Then don't. You. I'm not I may. I may own. I may own a liability case that is going to be a lot more expensive than. But you. You I'm, already. I'm going to move on. I'm going to close. We're wow. not having any more this discussion. Can I ask just one question, please? One more. Is there any possibility that you could put? Um, 
putting this into effect on hold pending um, a further look-see of the sidewalks and the problems at hand? Mr. Gilbert. I'm, not, I'm unclear. I mean, I've heard a question relative to the liability of a private property owner. I'm not sure what other question is out there. Uh, no, my question would be, there seems to be a, a number of questions about it, and I'm not suggesting that this hasn't been discussed ad nauseum for years, okay? There seem to be some questions about where's a sidewalk and where's not a sidewalk, about um, various issues of if the state comes and puts 12 feet of snow on the sidewalk, then what happens? So I guess my question is, um, there seem to be enough question. There seem to be enough concerns and questions about this, which I realize tab meeting voted. Is there some facility for uh, putting enactment of this on hold pending further investigation? I, I will be making that motion shortly. Um, Mr. This, Gibber, I'm sorry. Was, oh, I guess I'm. I'm, I'm on, other than the question about the liability of the private property owner, I'm unclear what the question is to the town. I mean, we know she wants us to hold are. off by voting on anything tonight to, to make this fully executable. But it doesn't, the obligation already exists, and if, as we've discussed it repetitively now, we're, as a town, we're only allowed to fine up to $300 per violation. So these alternative to that is if it doesn't get done and our understanding was it was a slim sliver of the businesses that were not clearing the sidewalk and this was a public safety concern because people were going out and any one of us that travels up and down 28 sees where these pedestrians are and has to avoid them in 28. So we, we, we implemented this as a means to be able to actually be proactive and do something for public safety and get in and remove the, remove the snow from a sidewalk and we know what linear square footage that sidewalk is and it would be up to the DPW director to invoice or calculate what the cost of that removal is. The business owner already has that obligation to remove the snow. That already exists and has existed. Right. <coughs> Any other board member want to say anything? I'm going to let Mr. O'Neill speak. I'm waiting up. for a turn. But I'm going to let Mr. O'Neill and then you and Mr. Sierra, okay? Please, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. I already said what I had to say, but I, my question is based on that last uh, comment. It, does the vote at town meeting say that the town cannot clear the snow? No, it doesn't, right? I'm not The aware town of can authorize Public Works to take care of it. And I think that's what the business community is asking for. Okay, look at this room. These are the people that support this community. Every single person here is the one that supports every single fundraiser that comes down the pike. I've been in business over 30 years, close to 40 years in this community. I have bought tickets to everything that has ever come down the pike. And this is the way you're gonna now play nickel and dime with people? There is no reason that this board cannot say to Public Works, figure it out, take care of it. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Masseri. I haven't spoken a lot about this bylaw, but to me, it's a flawed bylaw from the beginning. The board has never stepped up to make real changes to the bylaw. You know, if you, if you walk the sidewalks, they're all different. You know, I, when we plow, and I'm not picking on you, Andy, but when we plow the sidewalks for the schools, right, sometimes they're down on the ground because we've cleaned them and then it warmed up and it melted. And sometimes they're a pile of ice. And sometimes there's areas where you can't get the plow through because there's a pole. And someone has to walk out on the street. And if we uh, apply that back on Route 28, we have similar situations. Plus then we have all of the material that the state plows onto the sidewalks, whether they're a sidewalk at the very edge of the road or they're in, it's something that you have to deal with. And if you look at communities that are, you know, have all nice concrete sidewalks and, they're, and they go from one end to another, when it comes right down to it, what do they do? In the end, when the snow is heavy, they come in and they 
shovel it off, put it in trucks, and haul it away. And uh, you know, I think we have a situation where uh, how really important is it? I mean, if this article came up to me at uh, a town meeting in the beginning, back years ago when it came up, I, I would have voted no. Because I think that it's impractical. You know, it's, you go out there and it's, it's not one long stream. If it was, it, you could drive your, your, your snow plow down the road or your snow blower and uh, you know, maybe have a pathway. But it's never perfect unless, you know, when you go into the big cities, what do they do? You know, they have to clean the sidewalk completely. And I don't know how we, we can do that. And, uh, you know, it, to, do, to do it and to do it right so that it's perfectly safe to walk on. And I question what our kids walk on in some situations. Uh, no. Now, it's beyond what we can afford, well, Mr. and is Sarah, it really necessary? It, really, the right thing to do is not plow them at all, because we don't have a continuation, a continuous sidewalk on, on both sides. So, but unfortunately, this board, and this prior boards, before I even got here, in this, in the residents wanted a walkable Route 28 on the sidewalks that are in front of commercial businesses. That's what they wanted, and they, you know. Well, they you spoke know, I, and they I voted find for it, it. I find it interesting, um, Michael, that after this bylaw passed, I don't even, maybe Steve remembers when. Nope. Right? He's calling you The old. boards <laughs> leading up to a few years ago ignored it all. Right? Uh, no. Yeah, we do have a responsibility we didn't for enforcing ignore it. the. We voted it in. I, I think it's been like five times I've been on this board that the members of this board took it to town meeting, five times. It's at least five times. Oh, we took it to, to make modifications. I Modifi think, we modified it five gonna, times. How we're going to get it done. it's a flawed. But the original bylaw, right, and if you go back into the history of boards, I can remember one single board member who's not here right yeah. now. I don't want to pick on him. He's the one that said, oh, we got to do the sidewalks, right, because it's a bylaw that's in place. So, uh, you know, I, one of the things I'd like to hear is we, we've got – a group of businesses that meet regularly, they have meetings, they have a president. Uh, I'd like to hear well, what is a group you could come up with as a proposal that, that you know, will get a, get a job done and meet the bylaw. If not, then round up enough citizens in town and make a citizen's petition to modify the bylaw. Uh, you know, I, I Personally, I look at Route 128 as I'm not walking anywhere near there. I'm going to drive my car from one business to another. So uh, that's that's where I feel about the whole thing. And here we sit many hours talking yeah, about I'm it. I'm ready to move on. And here, it's so. almost an impossible uh, Mr. situation Larry to deal with. Mr. Larry hasn't to speak if you would want to give him an opportunity to. Thank you. I, I just think, uh, and again, I don't recall the first time this came up. And it, I recall it's come up 2009 and 2010. I recall it coming up several times, but you know I don't recall exactly what it, you know, what the genesis 2012 was. 2012 and 2013. Right. Worked it out. Yep. And, and, and I don't doubt you for one moment. You know I don't doubt you for one moment. So it's been eight years anyway, uh, in the making here. And I think each time that it's gone before town meeting, and each time we've had a discussion here, uh, I think our intentions were, were noble and good, but it uh, may have been noble and good for a cause that isn't able to be successfully implemented um, you know and, and I think each at each attempt we've, we've tried to you know get compliance first of all and I, th I think we get hung up on that for sure um, and, and while we had some pretty good compliance along the way the places that didn't comply obviously became a, a bone of contention and um, caused us a little bit of heartburn and concern because we're expending a significant amount of uh, human resources and from our public safety personnel uh, to go around knock on doors and try and get the police department to, the responsibility fell to you know for a mere 100 200 then a 300 dollar fine uh, in order to get compliance well if you look at some of the numbers it's cheaper to pay the fine than it is to comply with the bylaw uh, so this has been our attempt to okay from a public safety standpoint let's remove it and assess those property owners that that weren't complying with the bylaw <coughs> 
but again, Route 28 uh, is what it is at this particular point in time, and it's a, it's a, it continues to be a work in progress and has been for as long as I've been around, and, uh, and it's getting better, and it will be better going forward, but uh, it doesn't appear as though we can have a practical application here without causing undue harm and unnecessarily undue harm um, you know, for the business owners and property owners who do pay taxes. And, and I think, you know, Mr. Masseri pointed out, you know, maybe get a suggestion from the business community. I know exactly what it's going to be. We pay our taxes. As Mr. O'Neill pointed out, send the sidewalk plow down there. Just put it right down there. Um, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work and you can't do it, you know, try to not threading, do what you normally do as, as far as uh, uh, clearing the sidewalks. So uh, right now, I mean, it, out of the current practice, we just do the fining, correct? Knock on the door and do a fine. It uh, doesn't even cover our cost. I, I think we need to revisit it. And, and again, for the, uh, and again, I've, I've lived in town pretty much my whole life. While there are people who use Route 28 and walk Route 28 and bike Route 28, um, they're few and far between. And it's not necessarily and the number of people who would do it in the middle of the winter are a lot of people. Um, so that the, well, the convenience and safety of those people is important. It has to be practical. We can't afford, we can't afford as a community to do it and do it well. And business owners, for the most part, some of them cannot afford to do it and do it well either. If that's the case, let's recognize it, acknowledge it, and uh, come up with another solution or acknowledge the fact that it can't be done. Uh, you know, so, so you know, we can vote, vote this thing in, but whether we decide later on to actually direct the administration to go out and do it, I, I may be hesitant. Because, you know, when I looked at these numbers, when <laughs> Andrew put them forth, and I'm not saying Andrew specifically because he was tasked with the uh, uh, chore of, of coming up with what would it cost and what's it look like. And I think my comment was, for crying out loud, it's going to cost more to clear Route 28 than it does to clear the whole town. Uh, it doesn't seem practical, and it doesn't seem as though we should be, that's what we should be threatening to impose upon our business community and our uh, taxpaying business community to do so. It just doesn't seem to work. The, the risk reward associated with it and the, uh, the cost of, of adequate public access, which we don't have on Route 28 in a good day, on a good day, because we don't have a complete sidewalk system there. You know, I, I just, uh, I'm hesitant. And again, while I want to implement and uh, enforce the bylaws that's put in place, I think it's incumbent upon us now to, to revisit it and say, okay, uh, it can't work or it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, let's propose eliminating it. In the meantime, I'd like more compliance from the business community. I'd like some more assistance because we can we cannot commit we cannot commit you know public work resources necessarily that we haven't committed to this point in time. We're already strained trying to keep up with what's necessary what we're already undertaking. Um, I would think that from a business standpoint, you'd want to have your property cleared enough so that you can do business and have um, safe and adequate access. Less concern with pedestrian traffic on Route 28 because you don't have a lot of customers that are, you know, a lot of customers that are walking customers that walk a half a mile or a quarter of a mile to come to your place of business. They don't. They drive. You know? So but for those few that do, you know, try and comply and work with us, you know, looking forward here. And uh, we can revisit. I think we should be revisiting it anyway. Uh, We've well, gotten to a point again, and again, I, I, just like everybody else, I've gotten caught up in this whole thing. And recently, as this is coming to fruition, taking a step back and saying, much like Mr. Masseri, this doesn't make a lot of sense right now. It isn't practical. You know, it, it's something that we'd like to do, but it isn't economically feasible to do it. So, uh, if we need to do something now to continue. Uh, to implement the wishes of town meeting and the bylaws, you know, that we have something in place which is very impractical and uh, takes up a lot of our public safety and police department's time. But to impose, you know, a $1,500 bill over here and 
$800 over there or $2,000 and one of Mr. Hashem's up here. Uh, for what purpose? How many people would actually utilize it? And for what period of time? It seems to be extreme. Okay, so we're gonna move on. So we gotta take some action tonight or or take no action. Yeah. You know, either postpone it for another meeting until we do some more research because these numbers are new to us. You know, we didn't have these numbers at before town meeting, right? We didn't really see the full impact till just now. And I don't disagree. Um, but we have to, with the town, the people voted it in. It's there. We have a, a public safety department. We have a police department that, by law, have to execute the laws. And what they're looking for is some direction on how to do it. And that's our responsibility, whether we like it or not. If we don't like these numbers and we want to send the town administrator back with the DPW director to come up with something a little more affordable and that's sensible, then that's probably the right thing to do. But to just do nothing, I don't think we have the opportunity. Well, I think no. we have, right now, we have a system in place. But what we were looking to do was to relieve the police mm -hmm. department of knocking on the doors and giving them a hundred and two hundred and then a three hundred dollar fine mm -hmm. which didn't even cover the cost of the police officers going and knocking on the doors and then we were looking to do something else implement something else to accomplish two things one relieve the burden on the police department for doing something that seems to be somewhat fruitless and two to, from a public safety access standpoint get some compliance from the, from the business community to remove the snow that's in front of their property so we have something in place, Mr. Gilboro, now, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't take any action tonight, you still have something you can, if it snows tomorrow, you have the ability to execute the, the enforcement uh, would likely not change with the exception of, I think we have the ability to assess the fine on the first visit to the door now, rather than having to go through the previous warning, $50 or $100 fine. I think that we have that cap capability <coughs> now. So what would change is when the police department shows up to the door, the potential exists for there to be a fine assessed immediately upon the visit as long as it's 24 hours after the end of snowfall. Other than that, I, I, I don't foresee any other change taking place without us incurring a potential liability on, on behalf of the taxpayer here without a guarantee of a way to recover the cost. So we still have to go out there and do our own properties, right? Regardless of what happens tonight. That doesn't change, no. That has mm -hmm. been our policy to comply with the bylaw and it's it's every 24 hours 300 300 yes 300. each it's day is a separate defense yes right so the whole reason that we veered to this direction was to recuperate the cost so it is financially feasible because of this method versus just continuously going out and finding and finding and finding and not getting any well, we don't have the staff we don't have the police staff we have that was the issue that was one of the issues of yeah. going this Mr. route Yes, right. Mr. Schultz. Um, I think the five of us all agree this is a flaw, flawed bylaw. I think we all agree on that. I, I'm going to move right now that we just pass over on this and we work with the business community, come up with a better solution. And I, I just think it's just, uh, you know, we have to look at what is the cost of enforcement and administration of this particular motion versus just the town doing it. I don't know. I, we never really have explored that. And I think we know we got a flawed bylaw. I'm going to move right now. I don't even know if there's a second on this board that we pass over on this tonight and try to work you know, to craft a better solution, but I really encourage the Chamber of Commerce to get involved here in, in any business groups because you guys really haven't been involved, and that's part of the problem is, I know, Mr. Prisco, you've been frustrated. How many times have you voted on this? You said seven or eight times or whatever. I mean, five. a number of times. And, and you guys that are more senior, you guys have dealt with this for a long time. The business community has to come to it, and if we, we do pass on this, we can't have people not shoveling the first couple of snowstorms while we're still trying to figure this out. You guys got to work with us. So I'm going to move right now that we pass over on this. I don't know if there's a second, but I just put the motion out there. What's, what is being asked of us this evening is to approve the betterment portion of enforcement, correct? Right. Yes. The board the board's being asked to authorize me to direct the DPW to remove the snow with the intention of assessing the cost, and if not paid by the property owner, recovering the cost to lien that would need to come back to the board for approval sometime during, um, sometime after the winter season next year. And again, to reiterate, we're asking for this vote because we didn't want to proceed with enforcing the bylaw 
which we're authorized to do right now, by the way, uh, by assessing the cost without even asking for a vote of, the, vote of the board, only to have the discussion, as has occurred in the past, where we determine that we don't want to assess that cost um, later on. So we want that indication now so we can respond accordingly. Right. Th this doesn't, th there's a few things to note here. This doesn't stop someone from making a determination that there's a public safety threat and we're removing the snow anyway and we're not even assessing a cost. That could happen. It was something that was discussed in 2015, if I remember correctly, we made a determination not to do it that particular year. That, that easily could happen. We're not prohibited from doing that. I think Mr. O'Neill indicated that. But the intention for tonight was to try to seek that guidance in the instance that we have a snowfall after this meeting at some point in time and there's snow on the sidewalk and we need to uh, enforce the bylaw. Our intention would have been, rather than sending the police department out to enforce, send the public works department out with its apparatus and uh, remove the snow from the locations where the snow wasn't removed with the intention of assessing the cost. That was our intention. Okay. So this is what we could We could just pass this over tonight. Let's not, not vote on anything. And I think we're all in agreement, at least that the ultimate focus is public safety, right? That has to come first and foremost. I don't think any of us disagree with that. And having the sidewalk bylaw doesn't help us achieve that goal. It really doesn't. Because we do have sections that don't exist. They push these people out into the street. I think that's what we need to get back to. And if it's truly this, the, 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 um, the community's desire to have sidewalks, then let's put our discussion in back on getting the sidewalks on both sides of Route 28 funded and, and installed, and then we'll have to come up with a plan to make them safe for the winters. Mm -hmm. Certainly not going to solve that anytime soon, but if, I think that's a much better time spent than what we're doing with this. And I've been saying that for, since 2010 when I joined the board. Um, but I don't want to see <coughs> our police officers going around writing tickets every single day. It just doesn't make any sense when we don't have that many police officers to begin. So, but we'll implement the law as it stands because we have to do something because that's the law. We're not going to disobey the law. We can. We don't have that authority. Oh, yeah. If I agree. I like there's on. a motion to pass over. I've authored. If I don't anyone think we actually have that motion. I think we can just, just pass know. over the, uh, the agenda item. You disagree? Take no action. I don't, I don't know what, pass it over till when or take no action till when because we're in November now and the whole push to have this before the town at the town meeting was to address before. We did it. Before. It's been done. Yeah. Right. And what we're looking for was a pass it over till when? Next year? Well, or they can execute the bylaw as it's written today without this betterment change. The, the, the fine, the fine. Yes. Cool. That hasn't gone anywhere, so. Yes, Mr. Gilbar. We could, uh, to, so just to be clear, we could execute the bylaw by following through with the fining, right. the daily right. fining, yep. or we could execute the bylaw with by removing the snow and assessing the cost. And uh, the future point of decision would be if the board elected not to uh, lean the cost if it weren't paid by the property owner. So we, we have the ability to assess the cost, but if the cost isn't paid within 30 days, we yeah. can come to We're the board and say, issue. Yeah, yeah. But it, of course, there's going to be an expense associated with it, and you know the way that, and the finance director over there, I'm sure, can speak to it. The way the the accounting works on this, the cash flow works on this, is we're going to incur the cost now. We won't see the money until at least 18 months from now. Or so, when the, or when the property sold, or when the property sold, that's the reality <laughs> of, 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 of how this works. Yep. So, I mean, you know, clearly not not preferable, but okay. the only tool we see available to us right now to get the snow off the sidewalks. So, my desire is you execute the bylaw with the fines, and we do not use any DPW equipment at all until we get this figured out, because we're clearly not there. Because we're not going to have these guys go out and then put these liens out and can't execute to get the money. This seems reasonable. Mr. Masseri. I think the point you make about we're doing this all wrong, and what we ought to do is put a development plan together in detail of our Route 28, which would include sidewalking the whole thing. Yeah. So we That's now look like be spent. downtown Andover or downtown Reading with respect to that stretch of the highway. And then this issue would be a lot easier to deal with. Yep. Yeah. If that's what a if that's what we want, we but want Route 28 no, to be a walking. No, but you brought the other point up is we have a bylaw that unless the bylaw is changed, we have a responsibility. And I, as much as I dislike it, I clearly understand well, what we have to do. 
The fines so, are there. And I think that's the most logical way right now is to execute the bylaw based on using the fines. And, and that's it. You said from the beginning the same thing that we're hearing. You the, were the first one and repetitively saying, let's just do it ourselves. But that's not a financial financially feasible option. No, I don't think a finance, finance director would be pretty happy with us if we did that. Right. Yes. It's also an issue of time. How, how much time it would it take to, to do it? Yeah. And what is the compounding impact when, again, our, our winters are now a series of back-to-back -back storms yeah. over a six-week no. period. Andrew's guys are out there sometimes 20 hours. They, they need to sleep a little bit in, uh, you know, even maybe a couple days. So, um, I, okay, I think we got it. Let's move on. Let's pass over it. Let's take no action on it tonight. Okay? But Let's take no action on but, it tonight. But the business community needs to be forewarned. Yeah. That we could still take some action on it as much as we don't like it. But Yeah. We're, we're not we going to take any tonight, but we're going to have to reconsider putting it back up for discussion at another time. Okay, that's good. Okay. Can, can I just address a board question? How, how would the board like to address the business community? What, what ways do we... I need to come to the podium. I'm sorry. I... I the folks at home cannot hear you. Uh, my question would be, what, what ways would the board like to address the business community, get this message out through so, you know, chamber? Or different, I mean, yeah. how, how would we that We have be a liaison to the chamber, and that's and this time. It was me, and now it's Mr. Schultz. And it's his responsibility to connect with you all and to try to work on some kind of a, a subcommittee out of the chamber, maybe even have a couple of Reading members involved in it, and uh, try to come up with, take the bylaws that exist, break it down, and and try to come up with a solution. But I think what we need to do as a board, we have to make a determination. What is our ultimate goal for the town? Is our ultimate goal to create public safety? <coughs> yes. Is it to give a walking community on Route 28? I don't know. I, I know I would vote no, because I don't want people walking on Route 28 in the wintertime. I just think it's a bad idea. Well, I think Even if, if we had sidewalks on both sides. If you open up half of it, you're actually creating a public safety issue because you're encouraging people to walk on half and go out well, the street. No, the issue is we have residential properties on Route 28. They are not required to shovel those walkways. So even if every business community obeyed this bylaw, we're still telling the residents, go ahead and walk, but you're going to have to go out on the Route 28 at some point because you're going to come to a resident's house. That's a problem I have. I've, I've had this issue from day one. So besides the chamber, is there any, you know, that chamber might represent you know, 20%, 30% of the community, the businesses on 28 and the other property owners and things like that. How else can we get the message out to them so there is cooperation, so there's a partnership here? Because the chamber's only a small part I of think it. Yeah, the, the Facebook community connection is a great way. That reaches a lot of people. Um, there are businesses that are not part of the chamber. I did speak with the chamber board last, uh, it was last Wednesday, I think our, the last board meeting was, I did speak, I briefed them on this issue. Um, any business group in town, well, I, you know, I, Reach out to me. I'm happy to talk, talk to them. Again, yeah. the steps, Andrew, are you will work with them in okay. a subcommittee group. We as a board need to address it. What is our ultimate goal we're trying to achieve here? And I don't think we have made uh, that determination just based on the, what you're hearing tonight. And I think what we'll end up doing is you'll see us back in June addressing this in front of town meeting again saying, okay, you know, we, the bylaw that we passed in October of last year, had flaws in it and it didn't reach public safety. We did not achieve public safety with that bylaw. And I think that's what we got to start with. So, okay. Thank you for spending the evening with us. Uh, I know this took a lot longer, but thank you. And Andrew, honestly, you and Michael, I know you put a tremendous, and Liz put a tremendous amount of hours on these spreadsheets and these numbers, but it, you know, it really actually helped us realize this is, it really is borderline not realistic. I and mean, it's very expensive. And, um, yeah. When I saw the numbers, I was like, oh, boy, I knew this was going to be a problem. But let's get back to re what is really realistic. All right? Let's get back to that. And that is the ultimate goal is public safety. Okay. We're going to move on to the Arthur Kenny Field restrooms. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. O'Leary, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Gilberto, and then I'll fill in. But uh, just as a start, though, the uh, Athletic Facilities Subcommittee is uh, happy to report that things are progressing. You know, the old... Uh, Snack Shack is down. Uh, the uh, developer has is, is been on site. Uh, the layout as to where the uh, new structure is going to go has been uh, pinned to the ground, and we've uh, had a couple of site visits to make sure that's exactly where we want it to be. Uh, that's been determined and agreed upon. Um, the uh, time schedule is still going to fit what we're looking for. It's slipped a little bit, but that's okay. We get 
opportunity. It has to be done, you know, by around St. Patrick's Day on the 13th of um, March. Uh, the building's been ordered, but uh, tonight the board has been, again, we have the ultimate responsibility, the Board of Selectmen. Uh, has the ultimate responsibility for this particular project the way that uh, the money was appropriated and funded. So we will be coming back to the board periodically with updates and also for any uh, change orders that uh, may be necessary or any unforeseen uh, expenses that may be incurred. Uh, tonight the board is going to be asked to consider um, spending some of the contingency funds to get a, um, a brick veneer facade on the building rather than uh, painted. I think you've all been uh, uh, forwarded a, a couple of pictures of you know what it would look like uh, without the brick veneer. And Do we have those pictures with the screen by any chance, Michael? Don't go out of your way if you don't. I I, thought maybe I, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, I, I can get them up. But yeah, and, and then um, based upon where we are in the process and in talking with the developers and the architect, uh, it does it appears that the contingency is uh, sufficient uh, to cover the cost of the project uh, with some a uh, little bit of wiggle room. Uh, when we had the uh, manufacturer out, they offered us an opportunity to take a look at a, a brick veneer, which would be more closely matched the other team room that's there. And from a, a curb appeal standpoint, it would certainly look much better. The um, the veneer has a 20-year warranty on it, and also the the likelihood of it uh, breaking down is minimal, which is good, which is what we were looking for. Uh, what is the guarantee? It'll be 20 years. And uh, the subcommittee um, has recommended that we take advantage of the opportunity now. Again, we have to have uh, a significant amount of lead time with the manufacturer in order to get that because it's done at the factory. It's not done here. So if we don't act soon, uh, that opportunity will go by. Again, it will, it will be all within the appropriation. So the additional cost is, what does it make, about $11,000? $11,322. Yeah, $11,322 uh, to do the brick veneer. That would be covered within the contingency funds that we have available uh, on the project. So the recommendation of the Athletic Facility Subcommittee is for the board to approve that change order. Um, as far as any additional um, exposures that we have. Uh, we have a couple of issues that we're discussing with the architect and the um, contractor in relation to uh, some electrical issue. And what was the other? Um, uh, reconnecting the electrical yeah. infrastructure that's outside of the building itself. The right, which was on the original building. building. Which was the flagpole, the ticket and booth. And we have a meeting tomorrow to try to clarify the requirements relative to the fire alarm system. Uh, as it relates to the existing system and the existing team rooms. And again, the subcommittee is still uh, in negotiations with the uh, contractor, uh, so we don't have a recommendation this evening as to whether we need to address it at all or whether we, some of us believe that it was already addressed in the uh, request for proposals and uh, the bid package. Um, so that is yet to be resolved, so we're not going to bring any rec recommendations forward, but just to put the, uh, the board on notice that there are a couple of the lingering issues out there uh, of which we are not concerned as far as exceeding the uh, contingency that's available. So it will all be within the contingency, even if we uh, do have the exposure. So it leaves you with about 18000 left in contingency if we execute this change order this evening? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have two actions to take this evening, right? I think it's one invoice um, the contract. The, for the contract, for what's, what's been done. And then the one for the change order. Correct. Mr. Masseri. Uh, Steve, a uh, question I have is, is the... Uh, the actual uh, sewer line and valving that's required for the bathroom. And I don't know whether that's in place already, in the, the piping maybe. It will be in place. When they do the, um, they do all the foundation work, all the piping and infrastructure for the plumbing and all that stuff will be put in shortly. Uh, okay. And so again, it's so gonna be, my concern the building's is gonna be uh, shut down and drained. Yeah. My concern is that if there's any risk it's going to be there. And I say that because you know, you're, you're connecting to the current and you're running a pump into the, the current line that goes a long distance to get to the uh, treatment plant. It's actually not as, low, not as far as you think because it'll tie into where the yeah, table is. Yeah, so. I understand. Right, that. so it's actually and a short distance. The two, and you're pumping and will this create, is anyone taking a careful look at the valving such that 
one system is going to create a problem and for the other. Yes. So, uh, to me, I would be a little careful. I think the brick, by the way, is a good idea, uh, the veneer. Just to be careful that we, we get a little surprise. I don't know how much engineering work has been done in that area. It's pretty much up at all engineered oh, yeah. and everybody's well, satisfied that yeah. just Actually, so that would be my biggest idea. concern of all. Well, the good thing is contention. they're connecting to fairly new infrastructure. It's not like they're connecting to fifty-year-old infrastructure. It's yeah. it's new. It should no, be I understand very, that, very but easy. you get technologies of two pumps, yep. pumping up the line, and what happens if something uh, goes wrong up the line to the treatment plant, and now you're pumping. You may be pumping back into the other system, depending on how. And what the valving is and everything. Yeah, well, I'm sure so they have backflow can, you know, protection so on them. All. They're required by the law question. anyway. I, right. I haven't looked at all yep. the detail. Yep. I no. Go ahead, Kate. I'm sorry. I just have a. Qu I don't even know if you know this. I agree though with Mr. Mustier. I think the brick veneer looks excellent, at least in the pictures. Is that a 20 year warranty on the structure itself when it's mm -hmm. or just the veneer? Just the veneer. And is it at the after it's been in <coughs> place? Uh, installed, and then it would be 20 years from that Correct. time frame. Okay. Yep. It does look much better with the veneer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what we talked about. I mean, initially, again, we were, we still are, extremely cost conscious. You know, this is uh, one of the most expensive bathrooms that <laughs> in captivity here, you know, that we're, uh, that we're creating. But we're moving forward. Uh, so that when we got the bids in, and uh, we knew what the finite number was, you know, gave us some wiggle room again in there we had a thirty thousand dollar contingency the first meeting we had with the manufacturer representative uh, we talked about it and he said oh let me come up with a number and gave it to us and it seemed to be within reason and something that uh, we could and we were waiting to find out until after the site work was done and what contingency may be needed there things were unforeseen before we made any recommendation to the board to do so so we feel as though any exposure we have will be covered by the contingency that we can still get the veneer. Okay. Mr. Masseri. So I, uh, I had uh, pre-constructed front steps put in front of the house a number of years ago as the ones that was built fell apart. And the front faces of them have the veneer. And it's held up very, very well. I mean, I think you have to go with a hammer and chisel to mm -hmm. break some of it off. It's, uh, well, it's good to hear. Yeah. Oh, I have all the confidence it's going to be. Again, the, the, the technology, this isn't the old you know, New England Brickmaster no. um, stuff that people used to get done 35 years ago. Uh, the technology is, is far better, and the uh, what is going to be done under factory conditions is very important so that it won't be on site. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll come all delivered. Which is nice. You know, when it's built in a benign environment, it always gets uh, completed a little nicer. Okay, so we have any more questions? I'd like to take the two motions well, sure. if we could. One sure, time. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve payment uh, to Construction Dynamics, Inc., in the amount of $61,484.95 pursuant to payment requisition number one. And your motion to our second? Second by Mrs. Minnie Kelly. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve change order number one in the amount of $11,322 for purposes of including a brick finish on the restroom slash concession facility. And second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I uh, thank the members of the board for your support, and we'll keep you updated as yes. things progress. Thank the athletic subcommittee for all their time and effort as well. It's going to be a beautiful structure when it's done. Yes, uh, let's see what we have next is to discuss the medical marijuana dispensary proposal. Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, so the board has received uh, multiple letters from an entity known as Sanctuary Medicinals with an address of Quincy, Massachusetts regarding a property on uh, Concord Street, number 79 Concord Street in particular. Uh, which is a property that was the subject of previous discussion earlier in the year, if I understand it correctly, relative to a medical marijuana dispensary. And um, you and I had some conversation about uh, how to proceed with this, and the feeling was after town meeting that we would bring this back to the board for some discussion as to the initial response. I provided a copy of uh, an opinion that was received from town council that we thought 
largely answered the questions that might come up relative to how to proceed now, you know, with a big caveat that there are some regulatory actions and regulations still under develop at the state level that still are not finalized and the implications of which are still not known to us. Um, so uh, we're looking for some guidance from the board as to how to respond yeah. to this inquiry. So uh, if you recall a little time back, Mr. Masseri actually made a recommendation that we, we, hold, we hold off on these uh, types of letters until we see what the legislation comes back with. And I think we've all now seen what they've come back with, but they haven't finished it completely. But I think we have a really good idea where they're going with all this. So we have another, uh, obviously, a provider that's interested in um, bringing an offer to the town looking for a letter of non-opposition to move into the facility located at 79 Main Street. And so is this board, you know, here we are once again faced with this We'll probably be faced with it a few more times, and I think uh, you know the board has a decision to make if we want to allow these folks to come in and give a presentation. If you're interested in having this in the city, I mean, not in the town, you know, what do we want to do? So I leave it up for discussion. So anybody wants to start, Mrs. Minupelli. I I just I know that we got um, opinion from town council. And I don't know if I read it right, but it, is he saying that with the commission now being put in place that the medical marijuana regs are going to change? So we're awaiting those changes to the regulatory scheme versus what's in place? So in other words, it seemed like it was suggesting that with the Cannabis Control Commission that we will now be faced with new medical marijuana regulations. There may be, uh, with, uh, with regard to regulations, as I understand it from um, town council, uh, that the commission may promulgate regulations that have an impact relative to um, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. Uh, what those will be, I, I, I just I don't know at this point in time. Mr. Masseri. When we went through this before, uh, and my no vote came as a result of the individual company making the proposal, after there were a number of issues that kept coming up, but there was some other insight that came out of this, and the issue of can a medical marijuana facility, right, also create a recreational and at the time the law at least my understanding of it was they could and the company that was making the proposal to us back then had agreed that they were going not going to do that whatever that means and that was one of the reasons why it made a lot of sense to wait to see what the entire law is going to say because if the law doesn't if the law uh, doesn't separate the two then from my point of view, I can't, I can't vote on it. I can't vote favorably on it. Now, I know we're not asking to vote tonight, but uh, it seems to me that that should be clarified before we make any final decision. So I, I believe these folks, we just owe them a response before the board. Yeah, it's more, more I think a courtesy than anything else yeah. at this point. And I think Mr. Masseri articulated pretty clearly, I think, the concern of all of us, and I think that needs to be shared with this particular nonprofit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we do have to continue to wait, and hopefully we'll get the answers to these concerns. So until that's done, I, don't, I just don't think we can really take up anything until we understand that. And we were successful in going to you know, having a ballot vote and then having a town meeting vote in the recreation. I, I think we did the right things, and I just don't want to see us uh, make any decisions that could come back and make all that for naught. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of risk there. So if that's uh, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it appears as though, <clears throat> you know, the, the, what we, the action we took, which was uh, preemptive strike and early on, uh, strike it with firm decisions as to what we wanted and what we didn't want, what we were willing to accept, uh, it was important because currently, of the new legislation, the most recent legislation, mm -hmm. those actions have basically been grandfathered and we're okay, we're covered. So that, you know, we can allow medical, but we don't have to have recreational. Um, so I think from uh, the vantage point 
where we sit now. I think that's a good thing. We, the action we took was timely and um, wise. Uh, I think where we may have lost some opportunity if we're going to engage in uh, entertaining medical marijuana in the community is where we lost some opportunities in the host community agreements are going to be capped, from what uh, we heard from council here, as opposed to what they can offer or were offering before. And, uh, and we had a pretty good uh, opportunity and offer from CAS at the time, which meant a substantial amount of uh, resources on an annual basis to the community. I'm not so sure that those opportunities are going to be there for us uh, going forward, which is unfortunate. But uh, that being said, you know, to me, it's uh, the town voted for medical marijuana, opposed to recreational marijuana. Uh, uh, I'm not opposed to, I guess, entertaining it, but uh, to the point that other members have met here, made here, uh, until we get some more clarification, the Cannabis Control Board gets their feet under them and starts regulating and uh, formulates <coughs> some firm decisions. We're not sure what the impact is. So. Okay. So Mr. Gilberto, do you feel <coughs> like you have enough to <coughs> respond to this letter? I do. Just to share of our concern, and that, that's what we're waiting on? I may uh, check with town council to see if anything sure. has changed before we respond back. And if uh, there has been a significant change, we may you know, bring it for further discussion. But assuming there has not been, I think I understand. But once it's been cleared for the, been clarified in, at the legislative level, then uh, clearly they can go ahead and resubmit their request, I think. That would be the suitable time to mm -hmm. do that, unless anybody has an objection to that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, review the community compact grant proposal. So, Mr. Chairman, through you, um, we, had, we were um, provided uh, a visit by the Lieutenant Governor over the summer, um, relative, uh, just kind of talked with some, uh, with your, yourself and I, and um, stuck with Manny Pelly and some representatives of the school department relative to things going on in town. And in that conversation, uh, we indicated that we were concluding our projects that were community compact grant funded, one of which is related to wastewater on Concord Street and the other which was the regional uh, transportation issue which resulted in the rain ride program um, taking effect and the lieutenant governor suggested that uh, an idea that I believe you would discuss which was a park and ride facility and the identification of the appropriate site for a park and ride facility might be an appropriate project for the community compact program and a, as we discussed prior to submitting this as a community compact project I thought uh, we would uh, re review it with the board um, we reviewed the other priorities prior to submitting them in 2015. Um, we had a third um, that uh, was suggested to us by the school department, which ultimately wasn't funded because I don't believe that the state felt that it fit within the criteria um, in 2015. Um, so prior to submitting this, we wanted to get some feedback from the board. And again, the idea would be to utilize community compact funding in whatever amount the state can provide to potentially identify a park and ride facility and potentially do so in conjunction with the MVRTA as well. Yeah. That was there isn't is any objection. We'll proceed with that. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Great. Great. That's what we're going to do. Mike, are we uh, still? I do have one question. Mike. Yes, I'm sorry. Mike. Yes, Mr. 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 Go right ahead. Um, I take it the park and ride get you to Wilmington or Reading stations? Are there limitations on which one, or is that so part of the proposal? Or? So the, I think that I always envision it at least being very broad-based. It could be park and ride to go to Reading. could be park and ride to go to Wilmington. I think one of the... Andover? The, it could Uber. be to Andover. could be to Uber. It's any number of things that would make sense based on availability of parking, based on whatever the tolerance level is for park and ride participants as it is. I'm sure there's data that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, it could be park and ride simply to get on Route 93. Um, I just, you know, I had to take a bus to downtown Boston. Uh, I think the, the possibilities are endless. Okay. And I, I expected that the state would kind of help us from a high level. Okay, what's right. most feasible? Right, that's what the Lieutenant Governor had said, that she thinks that this compact would actually be very helpful for us mm. to identify all the opportunities and to see okay. what would be best for the residents in North Reading and we get them from here to there without having getting them onto Route 93 mm -hmm. or 128. By being able to park here in town, jump on a bus, get them to one of those transit locations, and maybe even some of them being part of what MVRTA is doing today. So, uh, and she agreed that, that would be part of the study. So, I'm not sure we'll get the money, but I yeah. think our, 
think we got a good shot at it. Mm -hmm. Feel pretty confident. But we just wanted to make sure the board was in agreement with that before we went forward. I think we're allowed up to three a year. Did they expand it? Uh, I'm not sure that they expanded. It was up to three in one round. So I, I think that there could be others, but I think yeah. that with the number of projects that we have going on. I still would like the, the schools. Uh, they didn't take it, um, advantage of this opportunity the first time we did it, and I still think there's a lot of great opportunity for them to be part of a community compact associated with the formula. You sure. Chapter 70 formula. So the school department did suggest a, uh, an idea in 2015 when this initially came through, um, and for um, whatever the reasons were, um, the, co the community compact program wasn't able to uh, to fund it. But I can speak with the superintendent to see oh, if they have anything else lingering that they may be interested would, in. If you would mind, I just don't want them to miss out on an opportunity. Yeah. Right? Sure. Okay. All right. We don't need a motion or anything, right? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right. 100, 100 Lowell Road, water easement. Mr. Chairman, through you, this is the uh, action associated with the town meeting's approval of the board uh, being able to, uh, uh, being authorized to acquire a full easement for public water supply purposes on 100 Lowell Road. Again, just as a brief history, this is an existing water easement with an existing town-owned water main and town hydrants, fire hydrants. That services the nine buildings, I believe, that are located on the existing Lincoln property slash Edgewood development. Um, the taking, so to speak, that goes along with this is a, effectively a change in language to allow the pipe to be used for any suitable uh, public water supply purpose. But uh, in all likelihood, the most significant use being the connection at the adjacent 104 Lowell Road as well as potential development and connection at 102 Lowell Road. Through, uh, what were constructed um, valves to uh, ex allow for the, the, such a service to take place. Currently, that water easement is restricted for use appurtenant to the town owned land to the south of 104 Lowell Road. This would make it uh, usable for any potable water purpose. And um, we, we had quite a bit of discussion. I think that our position in this matter is that um, the main exists, it's in use today, the, wa the hydrants are in place. Um, the, the, the impact upon 100 Lowell Road in terms of the easement, um, there's no change. It's already been constructed. And therefore, as you see, there's no recommendation for any damages associated with this. Per town meeting. But town meeting did not appropriate any funds for damages. That's correct. And town meeting authorized the taking. Although the, the board is also authorized under a separate statute for portable water supply purposes to also in initiate a taking. Yep. The town meeting blessed us. So what action do you need from us this evening? There's a vote, I believe, to approve, to, to authorize and approve. So to authorize in substantial form the order of taking, and then also to authorize the chairman to sign it um, at the appropriate time. Any discussion before we have? I, don't, I also don't think there's any damages because it's our, it's our easement anyway, so. Mm -hmm. It's just the use of the easement, or the use of the water in the right. easement. Mr. Schultz. Sure. Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt an order of taking substantially in the form presented for the purpose of confirming and establishing that certain water and sewer easements acquired by the town in 2008 in the land located at 100 Lowell Road and identified as Assessor's Map 14, Parcel 9, per grant recorded in uh, Middlesex County South Register of Deeds 51877, page 447, may be used to provide such utilities to any and all lands within the town as may or hereafter be served thereby and further to award no damages for such taking and to authorize the chairman to sign on behalf of the board the final form of said order of taking as prepared by town council. I have a second? Second. second. I have a motion by Mr. Schultz, second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, the reappointment of the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Mr. Chairman, through these are two procedural reappointments for two employees, one of which is myself, the other is the finance director, uh, who were appointed for three-year terms, the terms have since expired, or will be expiring, and um, we're recommending the board reappoint those three, two individuals. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I move Unless Mr. Kelleher objects. Oh. Well, maybe he does. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He has <laughs> wrong objection. Have, yeah. have you appointed... Mr. Schultz and Mrs. Manuelli. Yes, you, yes. That's, that's been done. Yes, I believe at the last meeting. Foti. 
What's uh, it? We have not done. I think it was just us two last time. Mr. Fody has not come forward. Fody, to us. Fody is just is, is is his term is one year term on the finance committee. So I think that. I think what, no, Mr. Fody was originally a citizen member, right? And they got appointed to the finance committee right. and continued on. So now there's three members of the finance committee. Right. So you've, you've overloaded the committee there, Don. I'll leave. I know. You can't leave. <laughs> By the way, you cannot leave. <laughs> Not too bad. Well, we don't have it for this evening, but we... So we need a citizen... Yeah. Activity. Okay. No, but we need a citizen individual. Okay. We'll address that at a future meeting. Is that okay? No, well, the, the, the seat that's in question is a citizen representative, if right. I understand it correctly. Correct. Correct. Not affiliated. Non-voting? No, no, it's voting. voting. He's voting. He's, He's a voting, voting, voting member. Okay. But when he was appointed, he was a former member of the board. Gotcha. And became citizen. a regular old citizen. He was willing to volunteer to be on the capital improvement Commit planning committee, and then somehow or another got roped into being on the finance committee. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> you know. And so I take it. That's no. what he's doing. Okay. So we need a citizen representative, and are you recommending that it's to continue to be him even yes, though he's I on am. the finance? Okay. motion it should be a motion continue mr. Schultz. sure mr. chairman I move to reappoint Michael P Gilberto to the capital improvement planning commission for a term to expire June 30 2020 second I got a second by mr. O'Leary any this more discussion you, you willingly doing this right yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as long as he doesn't you go to boot camp to tomorrow yeah. all those in favor aye, aye. aye. unanimous Liz while she's not here. Mr. Chairman, I move to reappoint Elizabeth Rourke to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee for a term to expire November 14, 2020. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. So we'll have to get Mr. Sh um, Fody to submit his car. Yes. So yes. Is it an activity request? We'll take his vehicle as well, though. <laughs> One, well, I'm just using the acronym. <laughs> One quick question. Uh, yeah. Michael, you, you're in Liz's uh, terms and at different times? Is that yes. Okay. So they're, they're our, our, uh, in conjunction with uh, our uh, uh, employment dates or anniversary dates. Okay. Uh, upcoming board meeting schedule. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Do you have, um, go ahead. Do yes, so uh, Mr. Chairman, through you, we do have recommended meeting dates. Again, we have a scheduled meeting on Monday, November 20th. The tax classification will take place that evening at 8 o'clock p.m. We have a meeting that we've been holding for Tuesday, November 28th for any business related to the conveyance of 104 Lowell Road. And I would ask the board members to continue to hold that date. That's the Tuesday following Thanksgiving yep. with the closing scheduled for the next day. December 4th and 18th is the first and third Mondays of the month of December where we anticipate taking uh, action on a number of items related to licensing and to reappointments, annual reappointments. Um, and that seems to fit well with the timing of the uh, Christmas holiday. And then um, due to the January and February holidays, we would recommend meeting on the second and fourth Mondays of January and February with there being first a holiday on the first Monday of January being New Year's Day. And then there's also a holiday on the third Monday being Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. So the dates would be January 8th and 22nd. And then we're recommending the same for the month of February, uh, meeting on February 12th and 26th, with there being a holiday on um, the, the 19th. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, I know you had mentioned potentially bringing up the meeting locations for discussion at some point. I, I have, I, I didn't put it in the packet, but I do have the school committee's meeting schedule if you wanted to bring that up. Well, I was going to mention to the board that, you know, as we get into the thick of the winter, this room could get particularly cold, especially your feet, and gets very noisy with that heating system running over there. So is there any interest in scheduling just a few winter meetings over at the distance learning lab. They'll turn the heat off on us. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, the heat's working in here tonight. It, it's <laughs> hot in here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> but I just throw it out there because if we're interested, then we need to get on the schedule to do it. If, we, if there's no interest in the board and you want to rough it out here in this room, we, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. But I just wanted to propose it because it can get pretty painful in here sometimes with the cold. Yeah, I get complaints from my wife about cold feet. Yeah. So <laughs> is there any interest in it? maybe the month of uh, February meetings? Even if it's one month. I'm thinking of his wife. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Let's not go there, and I don't want that in the minutes. No, he doesn't say it. Okay. Um, I know, Steve, you, you, I know in the past you, you were a little vanilla about it. I just want to make sure. I don't You don't see any need a better bit, but I'll follow the majority wherever you want to go. I mean, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I I'll put my work boots uh, on and I'll sit here. I don't know. I don't know what the. I don't know what the logistics. I don't know how the logistics work because I don't watch the school committee meetings. Or I, I don't know how the logistics works. If we have something to put up, you know how it's going to work there or not. Mm -hmm. How it works for uh, Noah Cam, I'm yep. not sure. Yep, Noah Cam. Not as good as that. The cameras are already there in the room, I believe, and they we can project, uh, and the public can see it, right? Phil, so we didn't yeah. have a bit of training, but yes. I'll I just want to have a question because this was also discussed. How do, how would, is there a closer door just for accessibility yep. or accommodation purposes than coming through the main so corridor? You got to park somewhere. Well, in in the layout of the facility, if we if we're able to open the main entrance to the high school, which faces the so-called um, bus loop, uh, where both the middle and high school entrances face. That cuts down significantly the walking distance, mm -hmm. yeah. but there is limited parking there. There are spots, but they are limited. Yeah. So we did speak to the superintendent, and he did say he would make that access available for us if that's what we'd like to do. I would suggest that the board members maybe park on the street and leave those open spots in front of the building if yeah, we want. We have to mark them though, because I'll tell you what. Going through the, there's cars parked there all the time. Yeah. But Mr. Masiri, what do you think? You like the idea? You don't like the idea? I, I'm neutral. I, I don't, you know. This is fine. Okay. I don't mind going there either. So, Mr. Schultz, you're in. No nope. opinion. Mr. Minnie Pelly, it's up to you. I would, I would yeah, whatever is a warmer option. <laughs> well, <laughs> clearly put your that's wool the socks on. Just need put need your wool socks on. on. I think it's a good thing. I mean, we fix yeah. this place up. You know, I mean, you look at it from that point of view. Yeah. But and what I like is yeah, there's a presentation going on. It's very hard to look back. Here, at least, we have the two sides. No, I, and I like it here. Too. The only issue I take is I really can't hear well with that heat. Well, let's running. fix the heat. Yeah, that's it. Well, we kind of fixed that. Uh, we just, with, with the feasibility study, you got to go through. Let's, let's, let's let that all kind of flow, <laughs> flush itself out. Is that a dig? <laughs> um, okay, let's leave it alone then. That seems like the majority wants to do, and you're going to have to wait when work boots. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next, um, nobody have any conflict with those dates that the town administrator just shared with everyone. And I really do appreciate everyone staying flexible on November 28th. It's important. Okay. It's important. Yeah. It's, it's a very it's big a, it's check. It's somewhat important. Um, it's town administrator's important. report. <laughs> and you got to go quick to keep the end up. No, Robert. I'm just kidding. No, you're not. <laughs> the other one that said Some that. of you are not kidding. The other right? one that said the other. <laughs> Where is it here? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you. Uh, a town clerk has completed the necessary posting requirements required by the Attorney General to finalize approval of the zoning bylaw amendments that were approved at June town meeting. We did not receive any appeals, uh, none were expected, and she certified that back to the Attorney General, which is the next step in those bylaws going into effect. Second, a friendly reminder to the public that dogs are required to be on a leash when in public parks, including Ipswich River Park, and a polite request to dog owners to pick up after their dogs. The Parks Department is installing additional signage and animal control will be conducting additional patrols of the parks uh, throughout the rest of the fall. The Department of Public Works contractor, Beta Engineering, is conducting road inspections in town through mid-November. 
These inspections are part of our pavement manage management program. Crews will be in a clearly marked Beta Ford Ranger or Ford Escape that's equipped with flashing lights and strobes. There was an advisory that's been up on the website that I attached to my report. Also, for residents who may notice, North Reading police officers will be participating in first responder no shave November. So you may see additional facial hair uh, on our officers. It's part of a fundraising effort that they, they are, are participating in with other um, public safety departments and there's an advisory up on the police department's webpage. Uh, I'm pleased to announce the appointment of Amy Luckowitz to the position of Youth Substance Abuse Grant Coordinator. This position is the federally funded grant, uh, federally grant funded coordinator program for our youth substance abuse grant. She'll be working closely with our Youth Substance Abuse Coalition, which is headed by Marcy Bailey. Ms. Luckowitz will assist us with the duties of her prior position as Youth Services Director while we follow the process to hire her successor with the Youth Services Committee. And finally, I didn't put uh, a written comment, but I'll, I'll make a verbal note relative to the efforts of our Department of Public Works, our Fire Department, and our Police Department uh, for last Sunday night and Monday morning's uh, wind and rainstorm, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, there, we're fortunate that the damage was not as widespread as it was in some other communities, but there were isolated areas here in town where there was significant damage, and they were on top of it, responding throughout the evening in dangerous conditions. Um, worked closely with uh, RMLD to try to move resources to get the power back on. Unfortunately, we were able to get the power back on for um, most people on Monday and with some lingering areas on Tuesday that needed to be addressed. So I want to thank the um, men uh, and, uh, and women of the Department of Public Works uh, who were involved in coordinating the information and dispatching the crews, as well as the staff at the police and fire departments for their efforts. Uh, and I also want to again thank the superintendent of schools for his uh, continuing to participate in those discussions as we plan and respond to these events. Thank you. This is Minnie Pelly. Do you want to lead us off this evening? Sure. Just a um, reminder for anyone that wasn't paying attention earlier that veteran services are Saturday. And uh, Ms. Magner mentioned that there might be a relocation of the batch elder. Mm -hmm. So to watch for that announcement, which would be on the town website, or her uh, be on the town website? It, it would be, but I also believe she's going to try to make a determination and to advise the paper in a timely fashion as well. So, so that would mean Thursday at 8 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> <Can't No>. <laughs> Hopefully sometime tomorrow we can make a decision. So please um, check the website and join in just commemorating our service members that day, thinking about them. and. Doing something special for them. Mr. Schultz. Uh, got a sad note and a happy note tonight. I want to give my thoughts and prayers to the folks down in Southern Springs, Texas, who went through that horrible church shooting at the First Baptist Church yesterday. It's just, words don't describe that. Uh, on a happier news, I want to congratulate our boys' football team and girls' soccer team, the high school, having great years. They both lost heartbreakers last Friday, I believe, but um, they both really represented our town well. and. Uh, Really gave it them all, and they were nothing. But they should simply just be proud of their efforts. Thank you, Mr. Masseri. Just uh, regarding the storm, uh, you know, I just like to thank RMLD for the efforts that they put in uh, doing the tree trimming. They had a fairly aggressive effort. You see them on various streets over the, you know, and, and kind of at the end of summer, <clears throat> and I'm sure that helped. I think about where my son lives, it wasn't until Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock in Londonderry, New Hampshire, that he goes power back. So, you know, I think we should give them a little bit of pat on the back for the kind of work that they've done. You know, a storm like that, you're going to have damage, and uh, it's going to take some time to recover. But I think they did a great job. Uh, Rather than me talk about the Cable Advisory Committee and where we are, I'll let you do that because I missed the last two meetings. <laughs> well, the Cable Advisory Committee, yes, uh, again, continues to meet and negotiate uh, with the uh, Comcast representative. We have another meeting tomorrow. That's correct. Uh, I get that. Uh, so there. we have another meeting uh, session tomorrow with the Comcast representative. It seems to be progressing somewhat well. <laughs> so that's good. That, I didn't say fairly, somewhat well. <laughs> but somewhat well, but it was progress nonetheless. Um, and again, the, um, the subcommittee is keeping the Cable Advisory Committee up to date too, having input as to how we're uh, moving forward with that. In addition to that, uh, 
it appears as though they are going to be reaching out to Verizon and starting those negotiations because that contract is up six months after this one expires. So negotiations with the Verizon uh, people will start quickly also. So uh, again, the INET still seems to be bone of contention and we're working through that. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, we have to do something, we have to address the situation. We're just trying to uh, get them to give us enough lead time and uh, hopefully cover some of the costs, maybe, but uh, we'll see how we, we'll know more tomorrow, maybe. But uh, my guess is we're going to have several more sessions. Go ahead, Bob. Are you sure it's tomorrow, not Wednesday? Excuse me, I'm sorry, Wednesday. Okay. Wednesday. <laughs> I haven't been it's doing almost Tuesday. Good, too good no, 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 I don't know. It's Wednesday. Schedule. Wednesday. Okay. Wednesday. <laughs> and cable advisory is meeting on Thursday. So. Yeah. That, that I hear. Yeah. I got it right this time. Okay. Anything else? Did you, Bob? Anything else? No. It's not like it's still your dime here. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you didn't. I mean, it's okay. No, no, no I, I, I figured that you, yeah. you had okay. at the last meeting. The, yeah. um, I, too, would just like to acknowledge uh, Department of Public Work, Public Safety Personnel, and, and Reading Miss Polite in particular uh, for the reference. Uh, the neighborhood that I happen to live in uh, was, was one of the harder hit oh, uh, sections of the community. and. Uh, even with all the tree trimming, you know, when giant pine trees come down and take out the yes. wires and knock <laughs> down and split two poles, and, um, and we had another section up on Lee Road, same thing, took them out. So it's, uh, but they did a terrific job. And again, by uh, probably about six o'clock on Tuesday morning, everybody up in the neighborhood was was up and running again, and that was a monumental task to undertake because they had, as I said, they had at least three poles snapped right off, and the wires come right down. So they did a terrific job. Um, and they were very good as far as, you know, as people going down the street communicating with people. So they were getting the word out and um, letting people know this is what we're anticipating, this is what we're hoping for. And uh, again, neighbors were looking after neighbors as they should, and uh, it's a nice way to again, get reacquainted with the neighborhood. Hey, you have hot water? I happen to have a generator, so if you want to take, come take a shower, take a shower. First time I had to use a generator for years, so it worked That's pretty good. Good. Yeah, good. Uh, the only other thing is uh, we all got some correspondence from uh, Mr. Griffin. You know, it, it, I'm actually heartened by the fact that someone in the community is, is taking an active role and interest in some of the, 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 the national mm -hmm. national politics. And, uh, and again, whether you agree or disagree with the position he's taking, I think it's important. Uh, I always believe that, you know, think global, act local. And it, I, I believe that um, public officials from the local level on up should be quizzed on a regular basis by our constituency, and um, we should be asked what our position is on things. And you know, his correspondence in relation to the uh, you know, President's Advisory Commission on Election Integrity, uh, you know, when the whole thing was, I mean, my own personal opinion is the, when the whole thing was formed, it was a, was a lark, and uh, you know, it was some sort of a, an effort to justify not getting the popular vote. And, I think some accusations have been made, and again, as far as you know, from the local level here in North Reading, you know, voter integrity here is uh, is important, and I think it's done very well here. I mean, we have no issues, and uh, you know, I've been running for elective office since 1972, and uh, North Reading election officials and Mrs. Stats and her crew uh, to date have done an excellent job. I think at the state level, you know, Secretary. Of the Commonwealth uh, Galvin ensures that uh, across the Commonwealth the integrity of the process uh, is really uh, intact and I think that uh, everybody who wants to vote has that right and nobody's in, rights are infringed upon. So I think the, uh, the commission is, uh, is an insult and uh, he's asking for our opinions, but specifically addressed to me, asking what my opinion of it and I happen to concur that I think it's a joke, I think it's a lack and I think it's uh, a waste of resources and time and energy, and uh, good for those secretaries as a state who would uh, were not complying with the request. So, uh, so I stand with Mr. Griffin if he's watching. From that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, I, I will. I do. I did want to say a few comments about the storm and the cleanup. Our RMLD was great, but I have to tell you, our DPW crew, they really stepped it up for our kids to be able to go out and have Halloween a few days after that storm and. Most of the trees were off the sidewalks or at least pulled aside or at least mocked with some yellow caution tape. Um, 
you know, and Chris Deming wasn't here. And congratulations to him as he got married a few days prior to that storm. And uh, so hopefully he was somewhere nice and comfortable laughing at us as we were dealing with it. But I left my house around 4 in the morning the day of the storm. And it was just, I've never seen anything like it. Honest to God, I couldn't get out of my neighborhood. There were tree down across every roadway I tried to go. I had to go up on a sidewalk and get out that way. Um, and then when I came home and I saw the amount of cleanup it was in that quick a time, uh, which was about a nine hour period, it was amazing. So I really think a, a sincere congratulations to the DPW for their response mm -hmm. and uh, staying on top of it. Because a lot of towns around us, Andover, North Andover, I don't think they had power for days. Andover, and Andover, Andover, missed school, I believe Andover, they had. North Andover, yeah. Tewksbury. Right. And um, yeah, it, we lost power at our school, but the generator did work. But I know we had to cancel school. It was the right thing to do, by the way. And so I want to thank the town administrator and the superintendent for making the right call because the streets weren't safe that morning. And it gave an opportunity for the DPW crews to get things cleaned up. It gave the kids from Tewksbury and Andover North had a two Halloweens. Yeah. Because we had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had kids from Andover. <laughs> we, we had kids from Andover and Tewksbury yeah. at our house, yeah. too. Sure. They tripled it. <laughs> they did North Reading, Andover, and North Andover because they were all on different nights. <laughs> yeah. so pretty good. Um, we, we had a group that said they were from Andover. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's okay. I still have plenty of candy left. Tell them to come by. This um, is Major Pelly does too. Pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I assume everyone received the email from Brad Jones' office regarding the Thanksgiving Day dinner on coming up this November 19th. It's an annual. Uh, Andrew would be your first, I believe, yeah. right? So you have to sing a song. <laughs> so be prepared. You need um, to respond to her. She's trying to. Yeah, the, uh, Paige and Amanda Doran, uh, if you could reply to them by November 9th, they're asking. It would be appreciated if you could do that. And it's a, it's a great event, i got to say. It's it's a class act, so uh, I think you will enjoy it very much. And the food's always good. We'll partake in the turkey. Okay. That's all I have for this evening, so uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second by Mrs. Minipelli. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Yeah. Masseri. Aye. Okay with it. Uh, aye, aye, aye. We're all Do good. We need a little call, no, I need a little call, but no, we are